If I asked you what the first video game ever made was, what would you say? Pong? Space Invaders? My Sims Agents? Wrong. Well, probably. It's hard to trace the origins back to one single game, as it all depends on your definition of a video game. But here are our contestants. Nineteen forty seven's cathode ray tube amusement device is the first. Invented by Thomas T. Goldsmith Jr. in Essel Rayman. There was no commercial release, but it had a patent and prototypes were made. The game was controlled by a controller with two dials and a button, and worked by moving a dot to hit planes that were displayed over the screen using a physical overlay. For some, the reliance on outside factors such as the plane overlay would disqualify it as a true video game. 1950 saw Bernie and the Brain, an electronic version of Tic-Tac-Toe, and 1951 saw Nimrod, which was used to play Nim. Both of these can be disqualified as they are games but do not make use of video. These games use light bulb displays, so a more accurate definition would be electronic game. That leaves us in July 1952 with a game called Drots, or Checkers. If you disqualified the previous competitors, this is the first video game. The game was programmed by British physicist Christopher Strachey, and you could probably guess what it was about. It's not an especially impressive game, but it is nonetheless a video game. There's also a 1954 pool game developed for the Midsat computer at the University of Michigan, programmed by William Brown and Ted Lewis. This was the first game to incorporate real-time, moving graphics. In 1958, a game called Tennis for Two was shown off for three days at an exhibition in the Brookhaven National Laboratory, made by a physicist named William Higginbotham. This was arguably Higginbotham's most impressive work, other than when he helped create the first nuclear bomb. Tennis for Two was possibly the first video game created purely for others' entertainment. The game was so popular at the exhibition that it was brought back the next year. After the 1959 show, it was disassembled and for a long time forgotten until it was dug up years later, as were the rest of these early examples. Which one of these is the first video game can be debated, but in reality, they didn't have much impact on video games as a whole. Welcome to 1962. This is Steve Russell and his game Space War on PDP-1 computer. This is where we really get started. The PDP-1 was $120,000, so the only places you could really get one was on a college campus. And if there was a PDP-1, there was Space War. The goal of the game was to blow up the other person's spaceship. It was simple, but it worked. The game was popular among the programmers and college students that got to play it. In 1971, Syzygy Engineering, created by Nolan Bushnell and Ted Dabney, released Computer Space, and, huh, this looks familiar. So why was this ripoff such a big deal? Well, in this one, you have to put a coin in. Manufactured by Nutting Associates, Computer Space was the first arcade game and first overall video game commercially available. Text-based games were also popping up around this time for computers. The games would give a prompt and the player would give an answer. A few arrived in the 60s, such as the Sumerian game, but they didn't receive as much attention until the Oregon Trail in 1971. June 27th, 1972. Bushnell and Dabney quit Nutting Associates and changed Syzygy Engineering into Atari Inc., naming the company after a term used in the old strategy board game, Go. Then came something new. The Magnavox Odyssey, released in September 1972, this is the first ever video game console. It started off as a prototype from Ralph Baer and Sanders Associates, Inc., who had been experimenting with the idea of home video game console since 1966. This one was called the TV Game Unit No. 7, aka the Brown Box. Here you can see it being used to play a ping pong game. It was licensed to Magnavox, who released it as The Odyssey. There were a few games with the system, most of them sports games. There was even a game that used a gun. It wasn't super popular, but the right people took notice, and if you think it looks familiar, that's because later that year, Atari came out with Pong. They then got sued by Magnavox and settled for $1.5 million. Nevertheless, Pong was a massive hit in arcades. It also received a successful home console release, and by that I mean there were consoles dedicated to only playing Pong. 
Pong was getting popular and people were noticing. Around the time, the term video game was starting to be used by the public for the very first time. Everything beforehand we have retroactively applied this label to. For the first time, the general public were aware of video games, and some companies started to see the potential, or at least in Pong they did. There were lots of companies ripping off this rip-off. In fact, there weren't really innovations in video games for a while, it was just a lot of Pong. In order to compete with the Pong clones, Atari released more Pong. In 1976, Nolan Bushnell wanted a single-player version of Pong. Bushnell was the only man on this project not named Steve. He designed the game alongside Steve Bristow and Steve Wozniak. The circuit board was designed by Steve Jobs. Jobs and Wozniak had founded Apple only a month prior to the game's arcade release. Breakout was a breakout success, and ended up spawning clones of its own. But everything would change in 1977 when Atari would release their video computer system, VCS, later renamed to the Atari 2600. The system was priced at $185.95, which equates to about $160 in current money. Unlike their Pong system, you could play multiple games made by multiple companies. The invention of the swappable game cartridge actually came from an engineer named Jerry Lawson from the failed Fairchild Channel F console in 1976, a year prior to the Atari VCS launch. Meanwhile, the arcade scene was getting big. Space Invaders, Pac-Man, Donkey Kong, and more were rapidly getting popularity. Space Invaders was an arcade hit when it released in 1978. It was a landmark title for shooting games and probably the most popular game since Pong. Like Pong, it was many people's introduction to video games. One of those young people was a Japanese man by the name of Shigeru Miyamoto, who would go on to design Donkey Kong, which released in 1981. It was another massive hit and a very influential platformer. And now, you can play these games at home, which was a huge deal at the time. Space Invaders, Donkey Kong, and Mario Bros. all on your Atari systems. There were also games you couldn't play in the arcade like Pitfall, which planted the roots of what would become side-scrolling platformers. Games were coming out left and right, and the public was eating it up. Some would call this the golden age of video games. The Atari 2600 was a money-making machine, but not for long. So what happened? In 1982, Namco's Pac-Man was the highest grossing video game for the third year straight, and Atari was seeing an unprecedented amount of success. Logically, Atari and Namco decided that it was a good idea to release a version of Pac-Man for the Atari VCS. This was a great idea, of course, and it was sure to make a lot of money, and it did. 7.2 million copies of the VCS version of Pac-Man were sold in 1982 alone. The VCS, by the way, would be renamed to the Atari 2600 later that year. That being said, we have some mistakes to discuss. Pac-Man for the Atari 2600 sold a lot of copies. However, Atari somehow overestimated how many copies would be sold, leaving 5 million unsold copies. Also, it was a generally disliked low-quality version of the game. Pac-Man gave Atari confidence that they could push out low-quality products and still make financial gains. Atari's next big idea was to make a game about Steven Spielberg's recent blockbuster hit, E.T. The Extraterrestrial. At the time, E.T. held the record for the highest grossing film, so an Atari game was sure to sell. Atari's parent company, Warner's Communications, paid 20 to 25 million dollars for the rights. Adjusted for inflation, that's about 54 to 67 million dollars. On July 27th, 1982, Howard Scott Warshaw was hired to design the game. Warshaw had a pretty favorable reputation in the industry having making games such as Yara's Revenge and Raiders of the Lost Ark. He had even been asked for by Steven Spielberg himself. The only problem was that the game had to be done by September 1st in order for release on Christmas, which gave Warshaw just over five weeks to complete the game, a challenge he was willing to face. When presented with the pitch for the game, Spielberg asked Warshaw, couldn't you do something more like Pac-Man? However, Spielberg eventually ended up approving the pitch, and Warshaw went hard to work developing the game. Atari skipped audience testing and went ahead to release the highly anticipated game. Due to the success of the movie, Atari once again overestimated how much it would sell. The game sold 1.5 million copies, which is nothing to scoff at until you look at the 2.5 to 3.5 million copies left unsold. The game was also reviewed very unfavorably by critics and is widely regarded as one of the worst video games ever produced, with many being frustrated about constantly falling down holes. 
There was an urban legend back in the day that Atari went to Alamogordo, New Mexico, and dumped a bunch of their leftover ET cartridges in a landfill. An excavation was done in 2014 to put this rumor to rest, and in a bit of comedic genius from the universe, among countless other Atari products, there it was. Now, while not the sole cause, these failures were a big contribution to what would be known as the video game crash of 1983. Most third-party companies were also making lots of games that just weren't very good. The crash occurred in 1983, however the effects didn't start to appear until 1984 and 1985. At this point, consumers had lost confidence in the Atari brand. By the end of 1983, Atari had $536 million in losses, with the sales of video games in America dropping from $3.2 billion to just $100 million in three years. Companies like Magnavox decided to drop out of the market altogether, and video games seemed destined to end up as just another fad. The United States was the biggest market for video games, but a company from Japan was about to step in. They've popped up from time to time, but no one could predict the impact that they were about to have. You might recognize the name. Nintendo has been around for a long time. The company was founded in 1889 by Fusajiro Yamauchi, and to put that into perspective, Nintendo was around when Japan looked like this. They started by making playing cards, Hanafuda cards to be precise. Normal playing cards had been outlawed by the Japanese government due to gambling, but since Hanafuda cards didn't have numbers, they were allowed. Naturally, Nintendo's Hanafuda cards took off, as their biggest customer, the Yakuza, aka the Japanese Mafia, decided to start using their Hanafuda cards for gambling. Nintendo's founder eventually retired from the company in 1929, handing the reins over to his son-in-law, Sekirio Kaneda, who legally changed his name to Sekirio Yamauchi prior to taking the job. In 1948, he suffered a stroke and passed the company down to his 21-year-old grandson, Hiroshi Yamauchi. Nintendo continued making playing cards for a while, even acquiring the rights to make Disney playing cards in 1959, which helped in boosting their sales. But even with the extra money flowing in, Yamauchi was getting bored. The 60s were an interesting time for the man. He tried to get into the instant rice and taxi businesses, but the rice stuff flopped, and he just kind of gave up dealing with taxi driver unions. My favorite of his attempted business ventures is neither of those, but rather when he decided to open a love hotel. According to David Sheff's book, Game Over, How Nintendo Conquered the World, the business was, for Yamauchi, a personal passion. It was said that he was one of his own best customers. Which is actually pretty sad, considering he had been married for several years. There's no photographic evidence of the place, and it's unclear if the hotel was run under the Nintendo name, or was just Yamauchi doing his own thing, but it doesn't really matter, the president of Nintendo had a love hotel, and that's pretty funny. Yamauchi also tried to get into the toy business, but to no immediate success. In 1966, however, Nintendo employee Gunpei Yokoi made himself a little toy that could reach out and grab things, just because he was bored. He later showed it to Yamauchi, who liked it so much that he decided to release it as a proper product. It was called the Ultra Hand, and it was a big success. Over 1 million were sold. Seeing the success, Yamauchi was ready to go all in. He was done experimenting and had even closed his love hotel. Nintendo was now a toy company. The toys did pretty well, Lego sued him for that one and lost. And in 1972, they partnered with Magnavox to provide casing for the Odyssey's light gun, the Shooting Gallery. A few years later, they started making arcade games, and in 1977, they lost money on their Japan-exclusive Pong clone, the Color TV Game 6. Thankfully for Nintendo, their sequel, the Color TV Game 15, was much more successful. Their first breakout success was their previously mentioned Donkey Kong arcade game. Donkey 
Despite being the president of Nintendo, Hiroshi Yamauchi did not play or understand video games. Very simply, he would rather play Go. In fact, the only time he played a video game in his entire life, it was a version of Go. He didn't even know how to use the controller. This fact is coming from Bulletproof Software founder and one of Yamauchi's few close friends, Hank Rogers. What Yamauchi did know was business, and now with the American industry in shambles, Nintendo was about to save video games. Nintendo released the Family Computer, or Famicom, during 1983 in Japan, and by the end of 84, 2.5 million had been sold. Nintendo then decided to launch the console internationally, officially releasing it to the United States in 1985. The US still had a stigma against video games due to the crash of 83, so releasing a video game system was risky. Therefore, Nintendo decided to make this video game system not seem like a video game system, by renaming it to the Nintendo Entertainment System, and redesigning it to look nothing like a video game machine. It would keep this new title for all future releases outside of Japan, except for in India and Korea. But, I mean, it still says Nintendo Entertainment System on the console. So, the NES was out. Compared to the Atari 2600, it had made substantial improvements, including improved graphics and enhanced audio capabilities. Then, Nintendo released Super Mario Bros. Super Mario Bros. was a breath of fresh air for gaming. The platformer was more focused on going on an adventure than getting a high score. Also, it was fun, and would go on to be the best-selling game for the next 24 years. The game spawned several sequels, a TV series, movies, and a seemingly infinite amount of spin-off games. An interesting side note is that the game was combined with Duck Hunt and bundled with the console in 1988. Duck Hunt was a game that used the NES Zapper, a light gun which was technology Nintendo had been experimenting with since all the way back in the 60s. Pretty much every member of the Super Mario Bros. team would become a legend in the industry. This includes, but is not limited to, the director, producer, and designer Shigeru Miyamoto, designer Takashi Tezuka, and composer Koji Kondo. They would of course go on to shape the Super Mario series for years to come, but first, they had another project to work on. The Legend of Zelda released in 1986 for the Famicom Disk System, a disc-based add-on to the Famicom that utilized floppy disks to play games. It was released for the plain old NES in 1987 for North America, as the disk system never left Japan. It was a non-linear open-world action-adventure game, not something very common at the time. In fact, the only notable game similar was Atari's Adventure from 1980. The only issue for the genre was that there wasn't really a great way to save your progress. Normally in games, you would insert a password that would let you skip to the last level you got to, but there weren't really any levels in Zelda. So, Nintendo made The Legend of Zelda the first game where you could save the game onto the cartridge. The Legend of Zelda became Nintendo's second new hit on the system, and would become another long-running series alongside Super Mario. Even outside of the series itself, many action-adventure games can trace their roots back to the original Legend of Zelda. Another game released for the disc system was Metroid, a side-scrolling action-adventure game that was similarly non-linear, emphasizing exploration and backtracking. You play as bounty hunter Samus Aran, one of the earliest examples of a female protagonist in a video game, though the fact that she's a woman isn't revealed until after you beat the game. In the game, you traverse an alien planet, gaining money upgrades on the way to killing space pirates and creatures known as Metroids. 
Like Mario and Zelda, the game was the beginning of another Nintendo franchise, and it was a very influential game in its genre. Although the game sold 2.73 million units, the series has never reached the heights of Nintendo's more popular franchises. Back in 1985, the Famicom version of the adventure game Portopia Renzoku Satsujin Jiken, or the Portopia Serial Murder Case, was released. The game was originally released for the PC-6001 in 1983, developed by Chunsoft and published by Enix, who would later go on to produce Jesus 2. The game was a murder mystery adventure game, where you would use menus to move between locations, talk to people, and use a magnifying glass to find clues. It was very impressive for the time, and inspired many other adventure games. Many fondly remembered games came out in the NES era. Some would call it the golden age of video games. The games were often very difficult, as developers were still learning how to make them. Some liked the challenge, and some don't. As with the Atari 2600, there were many ports of classic arcade games, such as Taito's Beat'em Up, Double Dragon. Though they weren't the ones to publish the game in North America, Taito was one of many successful third-party publishers for the NES. Some of the biggest third parties were Tecmo, Konami, and Capcom, who all developed and published their games. In the US, Tecmo is most synonymous with their Tecmo Bowl series, a series of American football games that started in arcades with simply Tecmo Bowl in 1987. The game was later ported to the NES, and the NES version was the first football game to include real NFL players, and it's maybe the first football game to be any good. Another classic Tecmo series that got its start on the system was Ninja Gaiden, a trilogy of Ninja Gaiden games released on the console, notorious for their brutal difficulty and boasting impressive anime-style cutscenes. As the Wikipedia article for Ninja Gaiden 3 states, Early reviews praised the game for its plot, gameplay, and difficulty. Later reviews criticized the plot, level designs, and the game's difficulty. Nevertheless, the series was a success. Speaking of success, Capcom was busy putting out great action platformers. DuckTales, Bionic Commando, Ghosts and Goblins, and most notably, the Mega Man series, also known as Rockman in Japan. Six Mega Man games were released for the NES, and the franchise is still one of Capcom's most iconic. The final of the three companies, Konami, was most well known for their Castlevania, Contra, and Gradius games. Three Castlevania games released for the NES, and are also action platformers, where you take control of a character from the Belmont lineage and traverse Dracula's castle so you can kill him. Gradius is a side-scrolling shooter released in 1986, based on the arcade game of the same name. The game was pretty popular and sold over 1 million copies. Popular Japanese gaming magazine Famitsu even had it listed as their runner-up for that year's Game of the Year award. As were most games, Gradius was pretty hard. While working on porting the game to the NES, Konami developer Kazuhisa Hashimoto could not finish the game due to its difficulty. So, in order to complete his work, he made a cheat code to make things easier. Up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, BA, sometimes followed by start. This is the Konami code. He meant to remove the cheat code before the game was released, but when the game shipped, it was still there. Initially, not many found out about it, but other developers at Konami took notice and started implementing it in their games. One game that utilized the Konami code was Contra, a popular run-and-gun shooter. The code became widespread after the first issue of Nintendo Power Magazine revealed that it gave the player 30 extra lives in Contra. This was very helpful in the game, as it was infamously difficult. The Konami code is now a fixture in pop culture. The code and variations of it have been implemented in many other Konami games, as well as non-Konami games, and it has been referenced in everything from movies to TV shows and even music. Moving on, let's talk about one of the most popular genres of the era, the RPG. Well, at least popular in Japan. The early years of RPGs in Japan saw games like the Black Onyx in 1984, which was developed by Bulletproof Software and its founder, Hank Rogers. The game is one of the first examples of a successful RPG in Japan, selling 150,000 copies. But the popularity of the Black Onyx 
was nothing compared to that of Enix's new game, Dragon Quest. Dragon Quest was inspired by the tabletop RPG Dungeons & Dragons, as well as the video game RPGs Ultima and Wizardry. The game was released to Japan in 1986, developed by Chunsoft and published by Enix. The game was written and designed by the Portopia serial murder case creator, Yuji Hori. The game's top-down perspective in an open world, random encounters, menu-based combat, and dialogue options would all become staples of the JRPG genre. No one had seen anything like it. The game did very well and was extremely popular, in part due to ads and articles placed in the popular Shonen Jump magazine, where the game's character designer, Akira Toriyama, was publishing his manga, Dragon Ball. Dragon Quest was brought to the West as Dragon Warrior, although to much less fanfare. The game's sequel, Dragon Quest II, came around in 1987, and improved on much of what the first game had to offer, most notably including a party system. Two did even better than the first game, but I don't think looking at numbers will properly indicate its popularity. The game's menu theme was turned into a J-pop song, and happened to be the first song in J-pop singer Anamakino's career. The song was also used as a fight song for the Chibarote Marines, a professional baseball team. Let's take a listen. <laughs> It's also worth noting that the original Dragon Quest inspired many others in the genre and created rivals, most notably Square's Final Fantasy. Final Fantasy saved the company that made it, and incorporated the system that let the player choose the class for each character, such as a warrior, thief, monk, or black mage. When Dragon Quest III inevitably came around in 1988, it was a phenomenon. The citizens of Japan were skipping school and taking days off work just to get their hands on it. 3 would feature more firsts for console RPGs, such as a day-night cycle. And just to emphasize how big of a deal these games were, here's Famitsu's first 6 Game of the Year awards before they were cancelled for 11 years. And in 2006, Famitsu let its readers vote on the top 100 games of all time. Bold claim considering they had not seen the games from the future yet. Anyhow. Dragon Quest 3 is number 3 on that list, 18 years after its initial release. Back to 87 for a bit, though not RPG related, Nakayama Miho no Tokimeki High School was released. The game was developed in collaboration between Square, who had just finished work on Final Fantasy, and Nintendo, more specifically, Nintendo R&D 1, the team behind Metroid. The game was produced by Gunpei Yokoi, the creator of the Ultra Hand and producer of Metroid. The game's writer and one of the designers was co-creator of Metroid, Yoshio Sakamoto. The game's other designer was Final Fantasy creator, Hironobu Sakaguchi. The soundtrack was composed by Final Fantasy composer, Nobuo Uematsu, and Metroid composer, Hirokazu Tanaka also worked on the project. Although not listed in the credits for the game, Hiroshi Yamauchi called in famous copywriter, essayist, and lyricist Shigesato Itoi for expert advice on the game, after seeing him talk about his love of video games on TV. This was Itoi's first connection with Nintendo, and he would go on to create the Mother or Earthbound series, and also do a lot of other things. The game in question was the first ever dating sim, and featured the very real then-idol Nakayama Miho. You could hear a personal message from Miho herself by calling a phone number given to you by the game. Besides that, it was a mostly normal adventure game, following the standards set by the Protopia serial murder case. If you used the wrong facial expression or verbal response, it was game over. Just like real life. What sets this game apart is that the goal was to date Miho, who was disguised as a schoolgirl, rather than to solve a murder mystery. That fact is what technically makes this the first dating sim, although it does not feature the common gameplay elements of later games in the genre, as they had not been introduced yet. Alright, let's move on. You've probably heard of Tetris. The game single-handedly popularized the puzzle game genre. 
It was developed by Alexey Pajitnov in 1984, a software engineer who was working for the Soviet government. Tetris was received well among those who played it during its first few years, but it wouldn't really take off until 1989. 89 was the year that Atari used its subsidiary Tengen to publish an unlicensed version of Tetris for the NES, and then they got sued by Nintendo because th that's illegal. The licensing story behind Tetris is complicated, and if I explained it, we'd be here for twice as long. All you really need to know is that Nintendo ended up with the console and handheld rights thanks to one, Hank Rogers. Oh, right, one month later, Tetris released for Nintendo's new little invention, the Game Boy, created by Gunpei Yokoi. The Game Boy was not the first handheld console, but hey, how many people do you see walking around with a Milton Bradley microvision? The Game Boy was like an NES in your pocket, except it had no color. But hey, if we have to lose anything, I'm glad it was the color and not the buttons or something. The Game Boy didn't have a lot of games at launch, but it did end up having a pretty good library at the end of its run. Basically, any big franchise that was on the NES was on the Game Boy as well. This was most of the public's first introduction to handheld gaming. Nintendo had a surefire success on their hands, but they were about to have their first legitimate competition. In terms of competition, Sega's Master System had done well in Europe and Brazil, but did not pose much of a threat to the entertainment system. Atari pushed out the 7886, but that didn't go very well. But then in 1989, Sega released the Sega Mega Drive, also known as the Sega Genesis in the US, or the Samsung Super Game Boy in South Korea, which was later changed to the Super Aladdin Boy. Anyhow, the Mega Drive slash Genesis was more powerful and had better graphics than the NES which was becoming a problem for Nintendo. At this point, they were still publishing games for the NES. For example, Fire Emblem Shadow Dragon and the Blade of Light came out for the Famicom in 1990, popularizing the tactical RPG genre. It was the last game of any real significance released for the console. Nintendo realized that they needed to step their game up to compete with Sega's new system, and thus began the first console war. Nintendo had their new console out in Japan by November of 1990 and in North America by 1991. It was called the Super Famicom in Japan and the Super Nintendo Entertainment System in the West. Nintendo was already on top of the market, so Sega was fighting an uphill battle. However, it was a challenge they were willing to face. One of Sega's most successful ideas was to appeal to the US market by releasing games with celebrities attached, such as Michael Jackson's Moonwalker. Most of these were sports games, though, featuring the names of popular athletes. One of these was Joe Montana Football. Of course, American football video games had been on every major console since the Magnavox Odyssey. But everything this side of the Tecmo Bowl was, uh... So, Electronic Arts was working on the Genesis version of John Madden Football, when Sega of Japan asked them to change it to Joe Montana Football instead. EA agreed. They modified their build of Madden, slapped Montana on it, and it was a hit. This gave a nice boost to Sega's credibility as the game was not available on Nintendo consoles. However, EA had other plans. The company's founder, and at the time president, Trip Hawkins decided to not scrap Madden Football and to develop both games, intentionally making Montana Football worse than Madden. John Madden Football released for both Genesis and SNES, becoming a massive franchise and creating the model of releasing yearly sports games, which EA continues to this day. Sega's next big step was to create a franchise and character to compete with Mario. It worked. Sonic was basically what would happen if the 90s manifested into a hedgehog. Sonic the Hedgehog was cool and sold a lot of cartridges. Sega had just created a new gaming icon. The game is unique for its emphasis on speed and the variety of different paths you could take to traverse each stage. The first Sonic game and its sequels were massive hits and propelled Sega into a neck and neck race with Nintendo. On PC, Sid Meier's Civilization came out, starting the iconic turn based strategy series and creating the 4X subgenre. DMA designed released Lemmings this year as well. The gameplay consisted of guiding these little lemmings through a level to the exit. 
It was a very original and fun idea, and you can still find Lemmings on many best games of all times lists. Also, in 1991, Capcom Street Fighter II redefined the fighting game genre. It helped revitalize the arcade scene, introducing an iconic cast of unique characters and improving on the combo concept, among others. It also popularized beating up your friends in video games instead of real life. The game inspired lots of other fighting games, including 1992's Mortal Kombat, a more violent fighting game with more realistic-looking characters. Apparently, if a six-year-old rips out someone's spine in video games, it means they're going to do it in real life, so the US made a rating system called the ESRB. I wonder what would happen if you put Mario in a car, said Nintendo in 1992. The answer may surprise you. This was the start of one of Nintendo's most popular franchises and inspired a whole new genre of games, aptly named The Car Tracer. Alright, it's been a while, so let's take a break from video games. The Seattle Mariners of the Major League Baseball were being set up to move to Tampa Bay in 1992, to the dismay of their fans. But the Mariners are still in Seattle, and Tampa Bay has their own team now, so what happened? Well, Hiroshi Yamauchi just swung in and bought the Mariners as a gesture of goodwill to the citizens of the Pacific Northwest, as Nintendo of America is based in the Seattle area and has brought Yamauchi a lot of success. Yamauchi was surprised by the positive reception from the people of Seattle. When American people say they are happy, they are happy. It was very astonishing, said Yamauchi in an interview with the Seattle Times. I could desire no more only that I could see such joy. Then I would see that the money I spent is alive. Despite having bought a baseball team, Yamauchi had never attended a baseball game and never would. Not even when the Mariners played in Japan, though at least he watched that one on TV. He didn't dislike baseball, but he didn't really like it either. After buying the team, he was asked what he did do in his free time. He said that sometimes he would play Go. I wonder what would happen if you put Mario in a Mario movie, said Nintendo and some film companies. The Super Mario Bros. movie would set the standard for video game movies, but was not a good standard to set and video game movies have had a bad reputation ever since. Speaking of not good reputation, Nazis. Back in 1981, a game called Castle Wolfenstein was released. You play as a prisoner of war in a fictional Nazi castle and try to kill Nazis to escape. It looks like this. They got a sequel called Beyond Castle Wolfenstein in 1984, which looks like this. Here is Wolfenstein 3D, released in 1992 for DOS, developed by id Software. A small team of people worked on the game, including programmer John Carmack, as well as designer John Romero and Tom Hall. Both Johns have mentioned influence from arcade games, Space Invaders in particular. Anyhow, Wolfenstein 3D was a first-person shooter. Not the first first-person shooter, heck, it wasn't even the first one made by id Software, but it was the game that popularized the genre and inspired many more. Many people had never seen anything like it. Writing off the success of Wolfenstein 3D, Doom the next year. Doom refined the gameplay of Wolfenstein 3D and was an even bigger hit. Most FPS games released in the years following were called Doom clones. You played as... wait... Bill Gates? These games are getting really realistic. Next year I might even play in the uh, big Doom tournament. You might wonder what I'm doing here. Windows 95 Yo, is Bill the Gates, so game. Up? Don't interrupt me. Fantastic. Well, I better go uh, work on cleaning up this neighborhood here. Uh, so, I'm off. See ya. Okay, then. You play as a space marine killing demons from hell with a bunch of guns and space guns and a chainsaw and your fist. It was awesome. The most important part of the game, however, was deathmatch. The deathmatch mode allowed up to four players to connect to an online network and play a competitive head-to-head -head game. The game was so popular it crashed networks upon release because so many people were trying to download it at the same time. Doom was a household name in the 90s and the game is one of the main reasons why first person shooters became as popular as they are today. Also around this time, graphic adventures and point and click adventure games were popular on the PC. The ones made by Sierra Online, such as Leisure Suit Larry, King's Quest, Space Quest, and Gabriel Knight were especially popular. Point and click games see the player pointing and clicking to interact with NPCs, non-playable characters, and managing an inventory of items in order to solve puzzles and continue the story. Sierra is actually responsible for the creation of the first graphic adventure game 
as they released Mystery House for the Apple II in 1980 as online systems. Speaking of adventure games, Myst is a first-person 3D graphic adventure puzzle game, released in 1993. It was developed by Cyan Inc. primarily by the brothers Robin and Rand Miller, and published by Broderbund. The game popularized the CD-ROM format of PC games, and was praised for its incredible graphics at the time. At the time, Myst was the best-selling PC game of all time, having sold 6.3 million copies by the year 2000. In the arcade scene, 3D fighting games were starting to pop up. Dark Edge, though being sprite-based, was the first with 8-directional movement. Virtua Fighter then popped up in October 1993, being the first with 3D movement in polygonal models. The next year, the genre would gain more traction with the release of Tekken. Nintendo also experimented with 3D on the Super Nintendo with the release of Star Fox, an on-rail shooter with anthropomorphic animals piloting spaceships. Donkey Kong Country also boasted impressive pre-rendered 3D graphics converted into 2D. The game was developed by Rareware, which would become one of Nintendo's best subsidiaries. Inevitably, the end of the console wars drew near as the companies geared up to move on to more powerful systems. Sega had Sonic, lots of sports, and lots of other very good games, but it turned out to be too difficult to compete with Nintendo's library. Nintendo wasn't trying to reinvent the wheel on the SNES, but they were perfecting the formulas of the most popular series. The system was cranking out classic RPGs left and right as well. Among these, Dragon Quest and Final Fantasy still stood strong. Both cranked out multiple games for the SNES with increasing popularity. Despite not actually being made by Nintendo, these series were often seen as Nintendo franchises, as they only ever release on Nintendo consoles. In the end, Sega's valiant effort with the Genesis wasn't enough to beat up the SNES. Nintendo sold about 49 million, while Sega almost sold 31 million, which isn't too bad. Even if Sega had outsold Nintendo in the home console market, Nintendo would have been fine with their eventual 118.69 million Game Boys sold. Sega did have a handheld, the Game Gear, but it didn't stand much of a chance. Lots of great games came out of both sides during the intense console war, leading to an influx of new gamers. Some would call this the golden age of video games. Anyhow, Sega released their next generation console, the Sega Saturn, in November of 1994 in Japan and 1995 in the West, which marked the end of the console war. Nintendo would still ride the success of the SNES for a few years and their battle with Sega would continue, but a new competitor would soon enter. Competition of Nintendo's own creation. Back in 1988, Nintendo and Sony agreed on a partnership to produce a CD-ROM add-on for the Super Famicom. Third-party developers were anticipating it, as the Super Disk format, as they called it, would be much easier to produce games for. At the 1991 Consumer Electronics Show, Sony went on stage to announce their new project, a console with a cartridge slot for Super Famicom games, as well as a built-in CD-ROM drive for Super Disk games. They called it the PlayStation. The very next day, Nintendo got on stage and announced that they were dropping Sony, and were instead partnering with Philips, Sony's biggest rival. This might be the most catastrophic mistake that Nintendo has made to date. Sony was rightfully not very happy about it, but they still wanted to get into the video game industry, and made an attempt to mend the relationship between the two companies. They struck a deal with Nintendo again in 1992, but nothing would ever come of it. Sony later tried to pitch a CD-ROM console to Sega, but upon being declined, they realized that if they wanted to break into the industry, they would have to do it by themselves. Nothing ever came out of Nintendo's deal with Philips either, as no CD-ROM add-on was ever released for the SNES, and the only thing to come out of it was a few awful Mario and Zelda games for the Philips CDI. You've killed me! Good. And on December 3rd of 1994, Sony released the PlayStation in Japan. The next generation of consoles would not begin in North America until 1995, and the companies would show off their new systems at the first ever Electronic Entertainment Expo, or E3. Nintendo was there, but they didn't really show anything as they had delayed their upcoming console, the Ultra 64, by a year. Sega got on stage to show off the Saturn, and said this. 
We started our rollout of Sega Saturn yesterday. We were at retail today with 1,800 Toys R Us software, etc., and electronic boutique stores around the U.S. and Canada. Our retail price is between $399 and $449. $399 was a steep price, and Sega had decided to release the console early, which angered retailers and led to a lack of proper marketing, meaning that many people didn't know that the console came out or even existed. When Sony got on stage, they did this. Some of you uh, might actually want to know what that price is. Uh, and uh, since it's a beautiful day here in Los Angeles, uh, I'm going to ask Sony Computer Entertainment President of America, Steve Reyes, to join me for a brief presentation. $2.99. Sony had already won up Sega, and despite a pretty good launch in Japan and some good games, the Saturn would go on to flop hard. It didn't even have a mainline Sonic game. The real competition this time around was between Nintendo and Sony. Before we go deep into this war of the consoles though, let's talk about Tokimeki Memorial, a very popular game in Japan and a seminal entry in the dating sim genre. It even attracted people who weren't fans of that type of game. The game was developed and published by Konami, being written by Koji Igarashi. The first game Igarashi ever played was Pong, and the game called Crazy Climber inspired him to get into game development. The man had programmed a couple of games, but Tokimeki Memorial was the first time he wrote one. He had help from his at the time girlfriend and later wife, who was also working at Konami, but on Castlevania. Tokimeki Memorial originally released for the PC Engine in 1994, but gained its popularity upon its 1995 release for the PlayStation. It was also released on the Sega Saturn and Super Famicom, but the PlayStation version is generally considered to be the best. It was not released outside of Japan, but there was a New York Times article written about it. In the game, the player has to raise certain stats in order to hang out with girls. For example, if you want to end up with the bookworm, you gotta have Humanities 130+, Exercise 100+, and Appearance 100+. If you're neglecting someone though, they're gonna start gossiping, which is bad news for you. That means you're gonna get hit with a bomb. Not an actual bomb, that'd be funny though. When a girl is angry at you and spreading rumors, it will be symbolized by a bomb icon next to the character's name. It means that basically, you're about to be a lot less popular. So really there's a lot going on in this game that you have to manage, which keeps things engaging. The most popular character in the game is the childhood friend and girl on the box, Shiori Fujisaki. Now outside of the reasons that you can probably guess, this is mainly because her ending is infamously hard to get. You have to have extremely high stats in every category, so you really have to put in the work to earn the love of Shiori Fujisaki. Miho Nakayama's Tokimeki High School may have technically created the genre, but Tokimeki Memorial put it on the map. No relation by the way, Tokimeki means heartbeat, similar to Doki Doki if you're familiar. Tokimeki Memorial was a success, selling over a million copies. Those numbers don't do its popularity justice though. The sales of Tokimeki Memorial related products reached over 10 billion yen, that's over 90 million dollars. That's the first time a game's character merchandise made more than the actual game did. And if that's not enough for you, let's check that Famitsu Top 100 Games list I mentioned earlier. Here it is at number 88. And here at number 54. And here at number 23, just two spots behind the original Super Mario Bros. And if that's not enough for you, there was a Tokimeki Memorial anime OVA made in 1990, actually, wait, that's pretty normal. What I meant to say was that there was a live-action Tokimeki Memorial movie in 1997. It doesn't actually have much to do with the game, but it does have Shiori Fujisaki, portrayed here by Kazue Fukishi in her film debut. So yeah, Japan loved Tokimeki Memorial. The popularity of Shiori Fujisaki in particular cannot be overstated either. 
she has appeared in all sorts of spin-offs and has transcended the series itself, being referenced, making cameos, and appearing in crossovers. But you would be wrong to think it stops there. Shiori Fujisaki was also an idol. A virtual idol. That New York Times article mentions it right off the bat. Shiori Fujisaki is a 17-year-old high school junior with long reddish hair and dreamy eyes who is about to release her first record. Shingo Hagiwara is a 21-year-old college sophomore who idolizes her. He goes to nearly every event at which she appears and has bought calendars, posters, watches, and mugs with her picture on them. Shiori does everything perfectly, he sighed. Of course, it was just Shiori's voice actress, Mami Kingetsu, singing in character, but the name on the CD was Shiori Fujisaki. Shiori Fujisaki is not real, but Shiori Fujisaki released three original studio albums and a compilation album. It was promoted as if Shiori was really the one singing and really was an idol. And it worked great. Shiori was actually a very popular idol, and her songs ranked pretty high on the charts. She even has her own music videos where she is just straight up animated into real life. Maybe she's real after all. Uh, alright, let's get back on topic. Video games, Nintendo 64. That's right, they've taken the cool part out of the name, and now it's just a number. Nintendo really wanted you to know how many bits were in its new console. And this was the last time that was a talking point. Atari actually made it to 64 bits first with the Atari Jaguar, but nobody cares about Atari anymore and it was discontinued the same year that the N64 released. One sizable mistake that Nintendo made with its new machine was sticking to cartridges. The Saturn and PlayStation used discs, and as previously discussed, nobody wanted to make games for cartridges anymore. This led to a lot of third-party companies closely associated with Nintendo jumping ship and starting to work on games for Sony's fancy new console. As a result, if you had an N64, you were probably playing a game developed by either Nintendo themselves or Rareware. The games that Nintendo and Rare made, however, were of exceptional quality, including Mario's classic 1996 venture into 3D, Super Mario 64. Mario 64 introduced several new things into gaming, most importantly utilizing a controllable camera in a 3D environment, an innovative feature as most games at the time used a fixed camera setup. The game was often praised for its satisfying movement, as well as the usual stellar soundtrack from Koji Kondo. It's one of the most successful transitions from 2D to 3D, and inspired many 3D platformers and collectathons in the following years, including Rareware's popular Banjo Kazooie, as well as Insomniac's PlayStation hit Spyro the Dragon. Also in 1996, Naughty Dog released their own 3D platformer named Crash Bandicoot for the PlayStation. Hey, plumber boy, mustache man, your worst nightmare has arrived. The character and game were clearly made as a mascot to rival the likes of Mario and Sonic. The Bandicoot never quite reached the heights of the plumber or hedgehog, but was still a very popular character and his game sold well. He did become a sort of mascot for the PlayStation, though it was unofficial as Sony did not actually own the character. Sony has never really had their own big mascot, but they did have Parappa from the first ever rhythm game, Parappa the Rapper. The game was published by Sony Computer Entertainment themselves again in 1996. I could explain it to you, but why do that when I can let the game's creator do it for me? Basically, the player follows the short words sung by the sensei and presses the button in rhythm to the rap. The rhythm of the sensei is shown on the top of the screen as button shoot symbols. The player just has to follow along and press buttons as shown to the beat. If the player presses the wrong button or is off the beat, the score will go down. The game was revolutionary and would inspire, you know, more rhythm games, most notably in the arcades in the following years, as Dance Dance Revolution came out in 1998. 
One more icon of the PlayStation was Lara Croft from Tomb Raider, a 3D action-adventure game developed by Core Design and published by Eidos Interactive in 96. It was a pretty high-quality game too. You could shoot things, solve puzzles, and jump on stuff. Lara Croft was really the most important part of the game though. Strong female protagonists were hard to come by, the only other of note being Metroid Samus Aran. Lara Croft was in a lot of commercials, and the game sold very well, becoming a franchise featuring frequently fun games. Actually, there was another popular game in 96 with a female protagonist. Resident Evil or Biohazard as it was known in Japan, developed and published by Capcom. The game coined the term survival horror and popularized the genre. At the beginning of the game, the option is given to play as one of two characters, Chris Redfield or Jill Valentine. This wasn't made to be as big of a deal as Lara Croft, but it's still pretty cool. The game sees you trapped in a mansion with a bunch of zombies, needing to solve puzzles and shoot zombies to escape. You can't just go around mowing down the zombies though, you have to preserve your ammo and resources. Usually, shooting a zombie once or twice will have to suffice so that you can pass them by. The game also used fixed camera angles to enhance the whole horror of the thing. It also infamously uses tank controls, which was pretty common at the time. Tank controls are as follows, pressing up moves the character forwards, left and right turns the character in that direction, and pressing down moves the character backwards. Your character will move like this even if the camera angle changes, so you could be holding up even though the character is moving towards the screen. These aspects would influence not only the future of the series, but the future of the survival horror genre. Oh, and around this time, games were starting to use voice acting more often. Most voice acting, at least in English, was cheesy, underwhelming, and or just not very good. Case in point, Resident Evil. Whoa! This hall is dangerous! There must be a back door somewhere. Let's try to find it first, shall we? Just a moment! I found something. What is it? It's a weapon. It's really powerful, especially against living things. Another game that invented the name of its genre that year was Shizuku, an adult horror visual novel developed and published by Leaf. It's the first video game to ever be called a visual novel, as well as the first game with a true ending among good and bad endings. Now, I know what you're thinking. I also hate having to look at letters to be entertained. The term visual novel has a bit of a complicated history. It was created by Shizuku scenario director Tatsuya Takahashi in an effort to distinguish the game from Chunsoft series of what they called sound novels. These are essentially the same thing, but with a different name. They both had the style of text laid over a background, but with visual novels being more focused on visuals than sound. In a way, visual novels are an evolution from sound novels. They're also sometimes combined and just called novel games. Visual and sound novels are both a subgenre of the Japanese style of adventure game. Many visual novels nowadays also use the display of a text box at the bottom of the screen with accompanying character portraits, while some stick to the original format. The text box with character portraits is also often used in the broader adventure game genre outside of visual novels. The gameplay of visual novels consists of simply making choices, somewhat similar to a choose-your-own-adventure book. The genre would not receive much attention in the West until the 2010s, and with that came confusion about what they actually were. There's no clear reason for this, but the Western definition of visual novel now encapsulates Japanese adventure games instead of being the other way around. This is probably in part due to the similar presentation, as having a text box and a character sprite is common in both types of games. Adventure games outside of the novel subgenre like the Portopia Serial Murder Case, Ace Attorney, and Danganronpa are distinctly different from novel games such as Shizuku, Fate Stay Night, and Katawa Shoujo. Main difference being that adventure games are more focused on problem solving and or puzzles, and can completely block your progression. Whereas in novel games, the gameplay is more like reading a book and making choices that impact the narrative. And you can't skip the game over in novel games, but rather a bad ending which makes you have to try again to get a different ending. Western gamers also loop dating sims into the visual novel genre sometimes, but this would also be inaccurate, though understandable. While they can be similar, not all visual novels are even romantic. The first thing that was was likely Leaf's third visual novel, Two Heart, which also ended up with a decent amount of popularity. 
In games like Two Heart, the love interest you end up with, if any at all, is dependent on the choices you make, rather than your statistics, as seen in Tokimeki Memorial. Alright, I think I'm done with that topic. Fun fact though, Two Heart sequel Two Heart 2 is in that top 100 list. On to the next topic. The Bullet Hell Shmup series, The Toho Project, had its first three releases in 1997 for the PC-98. Bullet Hell is an awesome name for a genre, and a type of shoot 'em up that is typically very difficult, as the screen is filled with lasers and bullets and stuff. I, I think the gameplay describes itself. The Toho series is developed by one man, known as Zoon, and the games have an extremely strong following in Japan, as well as a cult following in the West. Also in 97, Sony released the DualShock controller, a controller with two analog sticks, which was pretty cool. Many games were compatible with the analog controls, but the first game to flat out require them was Ape Escape in 1999. You used the left stick to move, and the right stick to use a gadget. For example, flicking the stick in the appropriate direction to capture a monkey with a net. Dual analog sticks would become the standard for video game controllers, and this is where it started. A game called Gran Turismo was also compatible with the DualShock, and was the PlayStation's quintessential simulation racing game. Gran Turismo set the standard for simulation racers on consoles, with the most realistic physics in the genre at the time of its release. Plus it had 140 cars, including some real cars. That's pretty good. Gran Turismo is the second best selling PlayStation game, with almost 11 million units sold. Gran Turismo 2 is right behind it at just over 9 million. Over at Konami, the success of the first Tokimeki Memorial demanded the sequel, but the first game's writer, Koji Igarashi, didn't want to be a part of it, and asked to be transferred to the Castlevania team. His wish was granted, and he started work as writer and programmer on Castlevania Symphony of the Night. He later took over the project as assistant director, as the previous director had been promoted. Symphony of the Night is a 2D side-scrolling action RPG adventure. It's called a Metroidvania. Metroidvania gameplay consists of side-scrolling action on a large connected map, with the player obtaining items and or abilities in order to open up different parts of the map and progress in the game. The Metroid part of the name comes from the Nintendo series Metroid, specifically the original Metroid that popularized that type of gameplay, and Super Metroid which improved upon its foundation. Despite Castlevania also being a popular NES series, it didn't take on this type of gameplay until Symphony of the Night, which is where the Vania part of the title comes in. Metroidvanias have since become more popular, especially in the 2010s with indie titles such as Hollow Knight and Axiom Verge. Symphony of the Night helped to define the genre, and was released for the PlayStation in 1997 to critical acclaim. Its sales were not astounding, but it did sell a solid 700,000 units. Over on the N64, Rareware proved that first-person shooters could work on the console with GoldenEye 007, a tie-in with the James Bond movie of the same name. The genre was previously believed to only be able to work on PC. The game also introduced stealth elements to the genre. If you were at a party and the host had an N64, you were probably killing each other in GoldenEye's awesome split-screen multiplayer. Either that or Mario Kart. The game was obviously a hit for Nintendo, and you'll still see GoldenEye on lots of best games of all time lists. Feel like I'm forgetting something from this year. Oh yeah. Final Fantasy VII. Squaresoft's Final Fantasy series had made a name for itself on Nintendo consoles, but decided to switch to PlayStation due to its CD-ROM format. Some marketing material for the game even took shots at Nintendo. One ad reads, Someone please get the guys who make cartridge games a cigarette and a blindfold. Possibly the greatest game ever made is only available on PlayStation. Good thing, if it were available on cartridge, it'd retail for around $1,200. Beyond the edge of reality lies a story of ultimate conquest. A story of war and friendship. A story of a love that can never be, and a hatred that always was. The game was marketed in the US as a cinematic, movie-like experience, mainly featuring cutscenes in the trailers done by Square's CGI animation studio, Visual Works. They may look rudimentary now, but at the time, no one had seen anything like it. 
Visual Works has continued to set the standard for CGI cutscenes to this day. They have since been combined with Image Arts to make Square's Image Studio Division. To the dismay of some fans, the game did not actually look like this in-game, but the blocky field models were made up for by the rest of the game's content. Thankfully, Squaresoft had a development team that was very familiar with the series, and knew exactly what they were doing. The game was and is often praised for its amazing story, which was written by Kazushige Nojima, alongside director Yoshinori Hitase, both of whom have an extensive history with the franchise. The original script for the game was written by the game's producer and Final Fantasy creator Hironobu Sakaguchi. The man behind the game's iconic character designs, Tetsuya Nomura, also had some creative input in regards to the story, as he was the one to stop Kitase from killing off almost every single character. Finally, the game's legendary soundtrack was provided by Nobuo Uematsu. Due to the story, soundtrack, cinematic feeling, and, and, oh yeah, the gameplay, the game received critical acclaim and massive popularity being the first JRPG to break into the mainstream in the West. The game is the best selling on the PlayStation with nearly 13 million copies sold. Years later, a veteran game developer stated, I always remember back to Final Fantasy VII. When I first played FF7, that to me defined the genre. And on Famitsu's Top 100, it's number 2. With spin-offs, a prequel, a sequel movie, anime OVAs, and cameos in other games, Final Fantasy VII is undoubtedly the most popular and most iconic Final Fantasy game to date. Even scrapped ideas from the game's development would come into other projects. One setting originally conceived for the game was New York, a setting which would later be used in Square's survival horror action RPG, Parasite Eve. A failed pitch for FF7 turned into its own game entirely called Xenogears, which would ironically turn into a successful Nintendo series. Anyhow, Final Fantasy VII was the reason many people got the PlayStation in the first place, and it was a huge hit against Nintendo. Angry at Square for ditching Nintendo, and baffled by the popularity of the RPG genre, Hiroshi Yamauchi referred to people who played them as depressed gamers who like to sit alone in their dark rooms and play slow games. It wasn't the only cinematic experience on the PlayStation, though. Let's go back to 1987, where a young game designer at Konami by the name of Hideo Kojima directed his first game, Metal Gear, for the MSX2. The game focused on stealth, which wasn't often seen at the time, and it was a success, especially the NES port, which sold 1 million copies in the US. As a kid, Kojima played some version of Pong, and Space Invaders captured his imagination as well. So if you're not familiar with him and his work, you may be surprised to find that Kojima originally wanted to get into the film industry. However, he was inspired to join the video game industry thanks to the Portopia serial murder case and Super Mario Bros. His love for film is more evident in his Blade Runner-inspired adventure game, Snatcher, which he wanted to feel more cinematic. The same goes for his 1994 adventure game, Police Nonce. Both games received critical acclaim. In 1997, Kojima would take on the role of executive producer for the Tokimeki Memorial Drama Series, a spin-off series of three games each focusing on a different girl from the original game, Volume 1 released in 97, with Volume 2 in 98. But before the Shiori Fujisaki-focused final volume, Kojima and his team finished up their next big project. Metal Gear Solid. The game was released in 1998, popularizing the stealth game genre. As was in the original Metal Gear and in Metal Gear 2, you can't go in and expect to be able to kill everyone, you will die. You have to sneak around the place and only kill when necessary. The game takes the usual top-down angle, but changes when needed i.e. sneaking up against the wall, or using the first-person view to observe your surroundings. The Solidar radar at the top right also gives you the enemy locations, so you have all necessary tools to sneak on by. The game also has several boss fights, most famously the one vs Psycho Mantis, who will read your mind in the preceding cutscenes, aka reading your memory card and judging how you've played the game. Your dreams? You 
like Castlevania, don't you? You enjoy role-playing games. I see that you enjoy Konami games. This was originally planned to go even further. For example, one scrapped idea was that if Psycho Mantis sees that you've played Tokimeki Memorial, he'd transform into Shiori Fujisaki and attack. Now that's terrifying. Kojima's film influence was more pronounced here than ever, as a large portion of the game is made up of cinematic in-game cutscenes and fully voiced codec conversations. Both critics and general audiences loved the game, garnering many near-perfect or perfect review scores, as well as over 1 million units sold. The most often praised aspects of the game were the story and presentation. Many said something along the lines of, it's just like playing a movie. On Famitsu's Top 100, Metal Gear Solid is number 50, right above, oh yeah. Developed by Game Freak and published by Nintendo, Pokemon Red and Blue released in 1998. In North America, that is. Red and Green actually came out in Japan two years earlier, but the games would prove to be a massive success overseas as well. The game's released for the Game Boy, and that's right, the Game Boy is still going. I probably don't have to explain what Pokemon is, I mean it's the top grossing media franchise in the world at the moment, and has spin-off mobile games and anime, different anime, anime movies, a live action movie, music videos, training cards, toys, plushies, a day, and a jet. Well, I guess that's kind of an explanation. Uh, the, the gameplay in Pokemon features a basic rock, paper, scissors style of turn-based combat, with a strong focus on catching Pokemon to use in battle. Need I remind you of the gotta catch em all slogan? The monster collecting genre started all the way back in 1987 with Digital Devil Story Megami Tensei, a game based on a series of novels by Aya Nishitani, and one of the early games inspired by the original Dragon Quest. The game sees you negotiating with demons in order to have them join your team. The Megami Tensei franchise would later branch off from the books and retain this mechanic in its future sequels and spin-offs. A similar mechanic is seen in Dragon Quest V. What set Pokemon apart was that there was 151 Pokemon in the game, and each version of the game had exclusive Pokemon that you couldn't skate in the others. This encouraged trading Pokemon with your friends who had the other version of the game, or just buying both versions because you're lonely. The social aspect of the game contributed to the popularity of the series, which had become a household name and an international sensation. Pokemon Red, Blue, Green, and Yellow have sold a combined 47,690,000 units since release. Alright, The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, Nintendo 1998. You've probably heard all this already, so I'm gonna make it quick. Ocarina of Time is a very influential game and became the template for 3D action adventure games, especially with the introduction of the Z-targeting mechanic, where you lock onto an enemy and the camera follows them. The game's director was Eiji Aonuma. Aonuma was hired at Nintendo as a graphic designer in 1991 but he had never played a video game before, so his at-the-time girlfriend lent him the first Dragon Quest and the Portopia serial murder case. Little did she know the effect that Aonuma's games would have on the industry. Ocarina of Time also has good music by Koji Kondo and a good story. A lot of people consider it to be the greatest game ever made. Alright, we're almost out of 1998. Let's get back to first-person shooters with Valve's Half-Life. Half-Life was something new for the genre, as it was much more unique and story-focused, than anything that had come before. Previously, games would start, give you a gun, and now go shoot things. In Half-Life, you have an actual story with scripted events, voice acting, and everything. Instead of being a beefy space marine killing demons, you're a theoretical physicist just trying to survive. The game also mixes things up with puzzle solving, platforming, and smarter AI than the other games in the genre, meaning you can't just hop in a room and immediately kill everything. After its release, the game was heralded as the best ever FPS, or at least the best since Doom. As of 2008, the game has sold 9.3 million units. 1999 was another year with a lot of good games. Not all are important to talk about extensively, so here's a speed round of great 1999 video games that aren't super important. There was Pokemon Gold and Silver, and great fighting games that came to arcades like Street Fighter 3 Third Strike and God of Mark of the Wolves. Capcom returned to survival horror with Dino Crisis and Resident Evil 3 Nemesis, while Konami released their answer to Resident Evil with Silent Hill. The equally terrifying Mario Party came out this year, 
as did the original Super Smash Bros., where Nintendo's All-Stars and Jigglypuff kill each other. And there's even more sequels, including System Shock 2, Spyro 2, Rayman 2, Age of Empires 2, Persona 2, Innocent Sin, Final Fantasy 8, Chrono Cross in Japan, and Tokimeki Memorial 2, where girls can now pronounce your name. Crash Team Racing lets you drive a go-kart as a bandicoot, and Roller Coaster Tycoon lets you build roller coasters. There's also Togi Hawk's Pro Skater, Jet Force Gemini, and the greatest of them all, Pepsi Man. Alright, this generation of consoles is winding down now, so let's take a look at the results. In last place, we have the Sega Saturn, with over 9 million units sold. In the second place, we have the Nintendo 64, with almost 33 million. And then there's the PlayStation with over a hundred million. Yeah, it wasn't even close. Overall though, it was a pretty good generation. Tons of great games, higher quality though often compressed audio due to games being on CD, and that 3D thing as well. Some would call this the golden age of video games. Sega tried to recover from Saturn's failure with their new console, the Dreamcast, which came out in November of 98 in Japan, but in 99 everywhere else. Except for India, they had to wait another year. It had some cool games and the first 3D Sonic games, the first of which being the best selling on the console. In 1999, Sega released Shenmue, an ambitious open world game where you can interact with just about anything. Despite not really playing video games, creator Yu Suzuki helped to make Shenmue an enjoyable experience. Most notably, it pioneered the quick-time event, a mechanic which has since been used in way too many games. The game was supposed to be the first part of a multi-part epic and sold over a million copies. Unfortunately though, it was a financial disaster as it cost way too much to make. It did get a good sequel though. The year 2000 was the last year for Nintendo and Sony to push out games before their consoles became irrelevant. Notable games were WarWare's Perfect Dark, a spiritual successor to GoldenEye, and Banjo-Tooie. There was also Majora's Mask, Final Fantasy IX, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2, Paper Mario, and Mario Tennis. PC games were still thriving as well, as they got Deus Ex, Diablo 2, and The Sims, which popularized life simulation games, in case you didn't have one. This was also the year that China banned the production, import, and sales of consoles. Despite Sony and Nintendo finding some workarounds, many Chinese gamers just turned to PC games instead, and piracy. <laughs> Oh, also the PlayStation 2 released. By the end of Sony's next fiscal year, it had already outsold the Dreamcast. As you can probably guess, the Dreamcast did not do so well. Sega cut their losses in 2001, discontinuing the console only 2-3 years after its release. This was Sega's last console, and that means Sonic is now on Nintendo. What has the world come to? Nintendo then entered the fray with the GameCube, finally switching over to Tiny Discs. During the year of its release, the GameCube had a few classics such as Super Monkey Ball, Luigi's Mansion, Pikmin, and most famous of all, Super Smash Bros. Melee. Here are the top 5 reasons why this game is cool. Number 1. Smash was still a very unique concept, hitting people off the stage and stuff. You can also beat up Mario. Number 2. More characters. From already seen franchises like Pokemon and Zelda, but also from franchises new to Smash like Earthbound and Fire Emblem. Number 3. It had more stages. Number 4. It had more game modes like Adventure Mode and the one where you kill the sandbag. Number 5. The mechanics are neat. Competitive players like them and this game has been a consistently popular game to play competitively ever since it was released. Super Smash Bros. Melee is the best selling GameCube game. Just about a third of the people that own a GameCube had this game. Moving on from Smash, Nintendo also decided to roll out a brand new handheld this year. They had released new versions of the Game Boy, like the Game Boy Color, but the new Game Boy Advance was something that looked more like a gaming device and less like a calculator. Not many super important things happened on handhelds after Pokemon on the Game Boy, so let's just go over the GBA's entire lifespan. The Game Boy Advance lived from 2001 to 2009 and sold 81 million units. 2D games were mostly relegated to the handheld, as most big franchises were transitioning to 3D. There were 3D games on the GBA, and they function. Yeah. It's time to say a list of games again. The top selling games are mostly Pokemon and Mario. Pokemon Fire Red, Leaf Green, Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald, Mario Kart, Mario Golf, Mario and Luigi Superstar Saga, etc. There's a lot more of that.
Intelligent Systems made the strategy game Advance Wars and also Advance Wars 2 for the GBA, as well as some Fire Emblem games which made their way to the West for the first time. Something that didn't come to the West on GBA was the court mystery adventure game that is Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney. All three games in the original trilogy were released on the GBA in Japan and nowhere else. There's also Mother 3, which unlike Ace Attorney, never left Japan, as of the recording of this video. There were a few new Castlevania games, plus Golden Sun, Zelda the Minish Cap, a couple Metroids, the Mega Man Zero games, the Sonic Advance games, Wario Land 4, and WarioWare. Also, Final Fantasy came back to Nintendo. Not with any new mainline entries, but with new versions of the NES and SNES games, alongside the spin-off Final Fantasy Tactics Advance. So yeah, the GB had a pretty good game library and people liked it. Also, you could watch Shrek on it. More importantly, a new home console competitor was about to arise. That's right, the absolute menace, Bill Gates, is back. And he's replaced the gun with the rock to promote Microsoft's new console, the Xbox. You may have been wondering what this draped device was here. Uh, this is the Xbox. And so, uh, for the first time, let me now unveil Xbox. Fascinating. There's not a big dramatic story about this one. Microsoft just saw Sony making big gains with the PlayStation and thought it was a good idea to join in. All they needed to get off the ground was some good games, and they got at least one. We are to see Wait, is, is that Steve Jobs? That. But this is one of the coolest I've ever seen. This game is going to ship early next year from Bungie, and this is the first time anybody has ever seen it. It's the first time they've debuted it. And so I'm very happy to uh, welcome on the stage Jason Jones, who is the co-founder of Bungie and the Halo project lead. Halo is the name of this game, and we're going to see, for the first time, Halo. What you see here is not how the game is released. The game was developed by Bungie, who was previously only known for their real-time tactic game, Myth The Fallen Lords, which was released for Windows and Mac computers. This new Halo game was to be a third-person action game, also for Windows and Mac. However, in 2000, Bungie was purchased by Microsoft, and the third-person action game for PC turned into a first-person shooter exclusively for Xbox. Steve Jobs was not happy. Halo Combat Evolved was released on November 15, 2001, alongside the Xbox. One thing Halo did right was the controls. There are similarities to GoldenEye and Perfect Dark, but the N64 controller didn't exactly become the standard. On the Xbox Massive Duke controller, you can move with the left stick and aim with the right stick. The right trigger shoots, the left trigger throws a grenade. There's a button to melee and a button to switch between primary and secondary weapon. You can trace the controls of all modern first-person shooters right back to the original Halo. In fact, compared to modern FPSs, all Halo is missing is a sprint-dedicated button. It had a good story campaign with local co-op, and a just as good multiplayer mode, making it very popular at LAN parties. Halo Combat Evolved was the beginning of a massive franchise, and ended up selling over 6 million copies. The game was the reason many people got an Xbox to begin with. All this to say, the Xbox was off to a good start. The PS2 also had a very successful 2001, with tons of hit games releasing for the console that year. One of these games was Grand Theft Auto 3, developed by DMA Design and published by Rockstar Games. Whereas the previous games of the series had a top-down perspective, the third entry would adopt a third-person perspective. You could run around a fully realized Liberty City in 3D, a city from the first game that was loosely based off New York City. Drive cars, commit crimes, run from the police, kill the police. That's GTA. Upon release, the game is largely praised for its open-world design and for the amount of freedom given to the player. GTA 3 was the best-selling game of the year, and has sold 14.5 million copies since. Despite being the best-selling game of the year, it was actually outsold in the long run by another 2001 hit for the PS2, Gran Turismo 3, which received near-perfect-to-perfect -perfect reviews from just about every publication. With top-notch graphics, gameplay, and sound design, Gran Turismo 3 was the quintessential racing game at the time, and ended up selling nearly 15 million copies. It is the best-selling game in the series to this day. Yet another PS2 release of 2001 was Capcom's Devil May Cry, which set the standard for and popularized third-person hack-and-slash games with its stylish gameplay and incredibly hot, cool protagonist. Another notable game to come out of 2001 was Eco. Eco is a puzzle platformer and action-adventure game where you play as Eco, 
with the goal of helping a girl named Yorda escape a massive castle. It seems to be the most influential game that has only ever really been played by game developers. I was going to list a bunch of games that Eco inspired, but instead, here's The Last of Us game director Bruce Straley talking about the game. But that, that was one of those times where it's just like, he, it was the very first game that I played. It basically shaped my entire concept of how core mechanics are built and exploited and then switched up in a way with context to story and how those two things parallel each other and then to come out with an emotional impact that made me cry. I cried. It was the first game that I ever played where it's just like I'm in with the controller in my hand and I'm crying and I'm just like, a game did this. And that shaped my entire concept of design. And just as a quick fun fact, Dark Souls director and current From Software president Hidetaka Miyazaki cites Eco as the game that inspired him to get into the business. It was also definitely a year for Final Fantasy. Remember when we mentioned how visual works cutscenes are some of the best in the business? Well, Square saw that and thought, what if we spend $137 million to make a feature-length Final Fantasy film? So they did. Visually, the movie was pretty impressive, especially for the time. Square lost $84 million. They were still good at making video games, though, as Final Fantasy X released for the PS2 later in the year. It was the first Final Fantasy with voice acting and received universal acclaim for the game story and presentation, including the high-quality facial expressions of the characters, which were very impressive for the time. If you could remember that Famitsu Top 100, number one is Final Fantasy X, though it's possible that there's some recency bias in play there. Konami was also doing well this year, releasing Metal Gear Solid 2 and Silent Hill 2 for the PS2. Metal Gear Solid 2 also saw an Xbox release in 2002. <sighs> That's a lot of twos, man. And was somewhat divisive due to a new protagonist, though critics loved it, and it sold quite well. Finally, Silent Hill 2, which was not only survival horror, but also psychological horror, and tackled very mature topics. The game is received well by critics and fans, and is widely regarded as one of the best and one of the scariest horror games out there. After 53 years, Hiroshi Yamauchi finally stepped down as Nintendo's president and let Satoru Iwata take over. Iwata was someone that actually played video games, which was a welcome change. The first game he ever played was Pong. His love for games grew from there and he joined HAL Laboratory as a programmer in 1982. HAL is a company associated closely with Nintendo and has developed many games for the company. Iwata climbed the ranks to become the president of HAL and then to later become the president of Nintendo. This was also the year that Xbox introduced their online service, Xbox Live. The Sega Dreamcast had experimented with online, but that was very limited. Xbox Live on the original Xbox was the first time that online functionality would be utilized successfully on a console. You could purchase downloadable content or DLC for games, and play online multiplayer for games that supported it. Xbox Live reached 1 million users in 2004 and 2 million in 2005. A unified online service was something Xbox had over the competition. The PS2 did have online capabilities if you had a network adapter, although the servers were not provided by Sony, but instead by the game publishers themselves. Nintendo had the same idea as Sony, but only 8 GameCube games were released with internet or LAN capabilities. This was very in line with the sentiment shared by Nintendo's new president that customers do not want online games. Nintendo jumped on the FPS train this year with Metroid Prime, and also released their social sim Animal Crossing in North America. Additionally, they let go of Rare, which Microsoft gladly bought up. Battlefield came out for PCs, and the PS2 saw the best-selling game of the year GTA Vice City, Ratchet & Clank, and Squaresoft's collaboration with Disney, the action RPG Kingdom Hearts. Kingdom Hearts was very popular, but it was the last game that Squaresoft ever published. Except for in Japan. In that case, it's Final Fantasy X-2. But this wasn't because Square was going out of business, but rather because in 2003 they were merging with Enix, who you may remember for publishing the Dragon Quest series. The newly formed JRPG monolith Square Enix now had both Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest under their control. This was actually supposed to happen earlier, but the immense failure of the Spirits Within movie made Enix take a few steps back for a moment, only regaining confidence after the success of Final Fantasy X and Kingdom Hearts, plus a money injection from Sony to Square. 2003 was also the year that Valve made their online video game store, Steam, available. Steam has had a stranglehold on the digital distribution market for PCs ever since though nowadays it does have some competent competition. It was also the year that the Famicom was discontinued. Wait, that was still going? What did keep going was the success of the Xbox, as the RPG Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic came out, being another very successful console exclusive. Oh, and also this year Call of Duty. The first Call of Duty game was released for PC, with a somewhat similar console version coming the next year. 
Call of Duty would go on to become one of the most popular and mainstream series in the world, the first few games being set during World War II, which people thought was pretty cool. The first-person shooter genre was really taking off now. 2004 also saw the release of Metroid Prime 2, but more importantly... Video gamers across the country are anxiously awaiting the midnight release of a game called Halo 2. 45 minutes and counting for Halo 2 to go on sale. The line right now is probably about 100 yards long. It is the most anticipated game in entertainment history. At the time of its release, Halo 2 was the highest grossing entertainment product ever. It was also a pretty good game, with fun online multiplayer and engaging story campaign that leaves off on an infamous cliffhanger. In terms of popularity, I would say that Halo was the Dragon Quest of the web. Halo is extremely popular in the US, but not as much in Japan, as nobody bought an Xbox in Japan. Whereas Dragon Quest is extremely popular in Japan, but not so much in the US. In fact, Dragon Quest VIII released just a few weeks after Halo 2, and they're right next to each other on the list of fastest selling video games. Halo was not the only successful Xbox exclusive of 2004, as Fables released, developed by Big Blue Box, a satellite studio of Lionhead Studios. Remember when we brought up a quote from a veteran developer talking about Final Fantasy VII? That was actually from Fable creator Peter Molyneux in a 2008 interview. On the PC front, World of Warcraft released this year from Blizzard Entertainment. World of Warcraft is an MMORPG, a massively multiplayer online role-playing game. MMOs usually require a large time investment and money spent over time, as they usually utilize a subscription model. World of Warcraft also does this. It was easy to get into and part of a well-renowned series, which helped it become the most popular game of its kind. It has grossed over $9 billion as of 2017, passing up its predecessors like EverQuest and RuneScape, while standing tall over newcomers trying to capitalize on the genre's popularity. There's also been a Star Wars MMO, two actually. A Tokimeki Memorial MMO, a Dragon Quest MMO, and two Final Fantasy MMOs. Actually, Final Fantasy XIV is probably the closest to World of Warcraft in terms of popularity nowadays. Some other games came out in 2004. Half-Life 2, I heard that was pretty good. And also GTA San Andreas, which used that GTA 3 formula again and sold a lot, again. Let's not forget E3. People were starting to predict that Nintendo would announce a new console after the GameCube was proving unsuccessful. A few months earlier, Hiroshi Yamauchi had some thoughts to share about the prospect of a GameCube successor. Though he was no longer president, he was the chairman of Nintendo's board of directors. He stated the following. Nintendo has no plans to release a so-called next-generation video game console at the next year's Electronic Entertainment Expo in Las Vegas. We will rather make a new proposal that uses the GameCube at its core. Only people who do not know the video game business would advocate the release of next-generation machines when people are not interested in cutting-edge technologies. Now the second part is debatable, but the first part is undeniably true. Nintendo did not have plans to show off a new console at E3 in Las Vegas, because E3 took place in Los Angeles. Well, the wait is over. This is Nintendo DS. <laughs> DS is not simply new. It's not just more functions or higher specs. It is different. Of course, Nintendo DS is not the only change in our future. I want you to know that Nintendo is working on our next system, and that system will create a gaming revolution. Nintendo started things off with the DS releasing in 2004 for North America and Japan, and 2005 for Australia and Europe. Unexpectedly, Sony also showed off a handheld at their event, the PlayStation Portable. For the first time, Nintendo had legitimate competition in the handheld market. Sony released the PlayStation Portable, or PSP, in December of 2004 in Japan, and in 2005 everywhere else. The DS boasts dual screens, the top being a normal screen and the bottom being a touchscreen. While the GBA was like a portable SNES, the DS was like a portable N64, or PS1. Also, if your friend has a DS, you could play multiplayer through local wireless. While a majority of the games were still in 2D, 3D games were starting to pop up. There were a lot of Nintendo DS games. Mario had a ton of spin-offs, but New Super Mario Bros. is also notable for bringing the series back to its side-scrolling roots, and being the best-selling game on the handheld with over 30 million units sold. There were, of course, a lot of Pokemon games, and many games aimed at casual gamers and non-gamers, with games like Nintendogs and Brain Age. 
plus a variety of shovelware in licensed games. Among all this stuff was a lot of great games though. For example, Level 5's puzzle adventure series, Professor Layton got its start, with its first four games releasing for the DS. All four games sold well over a million units, with the least being 1.91 million, and with the most being 3.94 million. The Ace Attorney games finally came to the West, the first time many were exposed to Japanese adventure games. The original trilogy from the GBA, the fourth game, a spin-off, and a Japanese-only sequel to the spin-off were all released for the DS. The system had a really good lineup of RPGs as well. A barrage of Final Fantasy remakes and spin-offs, and Dragon Quest IX released exclusively for the console. Seemed a bit weird going from PS2 exclusive to DS exclusive, but I guess going from the best-selling console to best-selling handheld isn't that bad for sales. All that to say, the DS was pretty unstoppable. But onto the competition. If the DS is a portable PS1, the PSP is a portable PS2. Just like at Madden 07 for the DS, or then Madden 07 for the PSP. The games on PSP were what you would come to expect from PlayStation. Grand Theft Auto, Metal Gear, Gran Turismo, Final Fantasy, Ratchet and & Clank, and Sony's exclusive hack and slash series, God of War. Oh yeah, Monster Hunter. Monster Hunter is an action RPG series and one of Capcom's flagship franchises. The series sees the player hunt down monsters, as the title suggests. And if your friends had PSPs, you could play co-op with up to four players. Though the series had few entries on the PS2, it really took off on the PSP. Collectively, the Monster Hunter PSP game sold 12.4 million copies. One of the games, Monster Hunter Freedom 3, or Portable 3rd, is the third best-selling game on the system, with 4.9 million units sold, right above Gran Turismo, and right below GTA by City Stories. This is especially impressive considering this particular game is only released in Japan and Korea. Monster Hunter has been super popular in Japan ever since, and eventually gained a Western audience as well. The PSP ended up selling a very respectable total of 81.09 million units. It just happened to be going against the best-selling handheld of all time. The DS family system sold over 1 million units less than the PS2 at 154 million. Both handhelds lasted 10 years, from 2004 to 2014. Alright, that's enough about that, let's talk a little more about 2005, the pinnacle year for 2000's Edge. This is a hedgehog with a gun. Looking past games trying too hard to be cool, there is one game that is cool effortlessly, and that's Resident Evil 4, the 13th game in the Resident Evil series, 7th if we're only counting mainline entries. It was supposed to be a GameCube exclusive, but Capcom decided to put it everywhere else too. The game is still survival horror, tank controls and all, but much more focused on action than the previous titles in the series. The biggest change from the previous games was the switch from a fixed camera perspective to an over-the-shoulder point of view. This viewpoint changed more than just the Resident Evil series and the horror genre, as it became the standard point of view for third-person shooters. Make the game more cinematic, add in some characteristically cheesy dialogue, make the main character extremely attractive, and you've got what many claim to be one of the greatest games of all time. It has also inspired aspects of other great games, from Dead Space to Bioshock to The Last of Us. Bingo. Alright, you know the deal. The console generation is winding down again. It's time for a recap. 6th Gen was kinda like the SNES Genesis era, but for 3D games. Most games were perfecting pre-established formulas rather than trying to reinvent the wheel. This more capable generation of consoles opened up a lot of possibilities for what could have been done with the medium. Some would call this the golden age of video games. The GameCube sold just over 20 million, being the worst selling Nintendo console up to that point. The Xbox did a little better with 24 million, most of which coming from North America. It sold well enough for Microsoft to stay in the market at least. So how about the PlayStation 2? Right, it wasn't close to begin with. Oh, and there's the Dreamcast down there. Forgot about that one. It's time to move on now, to what was quite possibly the most 2000s event ever held. Taking place on MTV in 2005, hosted by Elijah Wood, featuring a performance from The Killers and appearances from Tony Hawk and Lil Jon, the Xbox 360 was revealed, and was set to release in November of 2005, with one package for $299 and another for $399. Four days after the 360's reveal, Sony held their E3 press conference. The PS3 was soon to come as well, but not as soon as the 360, 
That meant that Sony had more time to market their new system. It also had a very weird controller. They should fix that. During the conference, they showed off a fully-fledged remake of Final Fantasy VII's opening cutscene as a tech demo for the PS3. This prompted fans to ask Square Enix for a real FF7 remake a lot over the coming years. The company later stated, however, that there were no plans to remake the game. And this brings us, a whole year ahead, to E3 2006. Some other stuff happened at E3, but let's look at Sony's press conference first. It's Ridge Racer! Ridge Racer! Remember that one? Uh, Genji 2 is an action game which is based on Japanese history, based on famous battles which took, actually took place in ancient Japan. So here's this giant enemy crab. The 20 gigabyte PlayStation 3 will retail for 499 US dollars and 549 Canadian dollars. And the 60 gigabyte PlayStation 3 for 599 US dollars, 659 dollars Canadian. PlayStation 3 will be available in Europe and Australasia on November 17th. Well, at least they fixed the controller. This is basically the PS1 price reveal, but backwards. The massive jump in price from the PS2 to PS3 did not please fans and really didn't help sales. Just for fun, I checked how much that 599 console would be today, and it's $815. That's almost as much as the Atari 2600, which is insane. Oh, right, the N Nintendo had a show that year too. We gave you DS, a new Game Boy, and new games to play on them. And now you say, you want a revolution? Well, we've got one. Ah yes, the Nintendo Revolution, what would later be known as the Nintendo Wii. Though not as powerful as its competitors, the Wii had a focus on motion controls, which was all it needed. This is really when Nintendo started to do their own thing, while Xbox and PlayStation fought it out. This generation of consoles brought many improvements that have since become standard. All consoles had wireless controllers, online play, digital storefronts, entertainment apps such as Netflix, and all consoles besides the Wii displayed in HD. Plus, the Xbox 360 introduced achievements across all games to keep players interested. Achievements were later adapted for PlayStation 3 and Steam, becoming standard for non-Nintendo games. The 360 launched a year ahead of the pack, on November 22, 2005. Unfortunately for Microsoft, it launched with some problems. The console was having some technical issues, most notably the Red Ring of Death, a general hardware malfunction which took the lives of many 360s. Well, you could get it fixed, and many people did. Microsoft extended the 360's warranty by three years, and fixed up all consoles for free. It only cost them $1.15 billion. But hey, it saved the brand. Otherwise, Xbox might have gone down the same path as Atari and Sega. The PS3 launched in November of 2006, and its launch, predictably, was not too good either. As we have established, it was overpriced, and its game library didn't have much going on. Remember that Final Fantasy VII quote from Peter Molyneux earlier? That wasn't actually the whole quote. He says, those were the oh my god moments in Final Fantasy VII. I don't believe they exist. I haven't seen many of those on the PS3. Given 50 Cent Blood on the Sand hadn't released yet. The Wii did not have a complete disaster of a launch. Good for Nintendo. In North America, the Wii came out on November 19th just two days after the PS3, but for half the price. One of the launch titles was the new Zelda game, Twilight Princess, but most people were content with just Wii Sports. Motion controls were in, and the Wii was selling well along with Wii Sports, which sold only around 83 million copies. That makes it currently the third best-selling game up to this point in history, and the best-selling game to release on only one console. Nintendo's strategy was to appeal to casual gamers and non-gamers alike. And there they succeeded. People just couldn't get enough of the Wii and its accessories and peripherals. They'd been around since the Magnavox Odyssey, but they really took off here. 
going back to that year's E3, Square Enix had some exciting reveals. Not only was Final Fantasy XIII revealed, but two other Final Fantasy games, known together as the Fabula Novus Crystallis series. Though part of the same series, they were independent from one another, with their own worlds and characters. One of these was Final Fantasy Agito XIII, which was released five years later as Final Fantasy Type-0. The other was Final Fantasy vs. XIII, directed by Tetsuya Nomura. Nomura had now proven himself by directing the first three Kingdom Hearts games and the animated sequel to Final Fantasy VII, Advent Children. And we'll keep an eye on this one. I wonder what Sega's doing about now. Right. After the mixed responses to Sonic Heroes and Shadow the Hedgehog, Sonic Team was hoping to rejuvenate the series for its 15th anniversary. Sonic the Hedgehog, also known as Sonic 06, was released. And it has achieved just as much notoriety as Atari's E.T. To say that Sonic 06 was received poorly would be an understatement. The game was lambasted online for its plethora of bugs and glitches, and yeah. You can often find this game on worst games of all time lists, and it tarnished Sonic's reputation for years. As I mentioned it being lambasted online, now is probably a good time to talk about the growing online gaming community. Video game based content was starting to hit its stride with shows like The Angry Video Game Nerd and Red vs. Blue, as well as websites like ScrewAttack. Online gaming forums like GameFAQs were also quite popular. Flash games were popular as well, being hosted on sites like Addicting Games Congregate and most popular of all, Newgrounds. Flash was an easy to use program for anyone that wanted to make their own game, and once you finished your own game, you could have it uploaded to different websites. These games were popular for years, and several independent developers got their start thanks to Flash. Alright, now before we move on to 2007, let's remember that Famitsu Top 100 list voted on by its readers. Yep, that was this year. See how many games you can recognize. And now we're in 2007, one of the most well-regarded years in gaming's history. Lots of great games came out this year, and leading the pack are two critically acclaimed first-person shooters. Bungie came out with Halo 3, wrapping up the original Halo trilogy, and breaking Halo 2's sales record. Activision released Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare, developed by Infinity Ward, continuing the constant barrage of Call of Duty games, but keeping things fresh by switching from a World War II setting to a modern military setting. Both games were praised for their single-player campaigns, as well as their very popular online multiplayer modes. It's safe to say that the FPS was the most popular genre in this era, and the thought that they couldn't work on consoles was long gone. Playground arguments were now not only about console versus console, but also Halo versus Call of Duty. But those two aren't the sole reason that 2007 is held in such high regards. New series that started in the year include Bioshock, Mass Effect, Uncharted, Assassin's Creed, Rock Band, and Portal. Portal being one of three games included in the Orange Box, a package also including Half-Life 2 Episode 2 and Team Fortress 2. Other sequels of the year included Super Mario Galaxy, Metroid Prime 3, Guitar Hero 3, and Madden NFL 08, one of the most beloved games in the Madden series. EA Sports games have been near the top, if not at the top, of sales charts for years by the way, and they weren't slowing down. There are also a few games that came out in 2007 in some regions, but not others. The World Ends With You and Persona 3 FES came out in Japan, the original Persona 3 came out in North America, and Pokemon Diamond and Pearl released in North America, Australia, and Europe. No super important innovations were made that year, there was just a lot of really good games. 2008 and 2009 continued the trend of pretty good games, but nothing of much importance. In 2008, we got Mirror's Edge, a cool first-person parkour game, Dead Space Survival Horror in Space, 
Left 4 Dead, multiplayer survival horror in Not Space, and Little Big Planets, where you can create and share your own 2D platforming levels. Bethesda released their open world RPG Fallout 3, which was popular among critics and fans alike. A couple reasons to buy an Xbox that aren't Halo returned, with Gears of War 2 and Fable 2. Then we got Metal Gear Solid 4 and GTA 4. These all did pretty well. At E3 that year, a new Final Fantasy XIII trailer was shown by Microsoft. The game would be coming to Xbox 360 as well as PS3. This was a big blow to PlayStation, as Final Fantasy had been PlayStation exclusive for nearly a decade. A new trailer for Versus 13 was also shown at this year's Jump Festa, though there was no gameplay shown as little progress had been made. The Wii this year had Mario Kart Wii and Super Smash Bros. Brawl, which included non-Nintendo characters for the first time, with Sonic the Hedgehog and Snake from Metal Gear Solid. It is also well remembered for its adventure mode The Subspace Emissary, which was written by series director Masahiro Sakurai, and Kazushige Nojima, who you may remember as being one of the writers for Final Fantasy VII. Brawl's gameplay is not as well remembered and competitive players stuck with Melee. There was one game that came seemingly out of nowhere, a puzzle game by EA called Boom Blocks, designed by... wait, Steven Spielberg? Yeah, Steven Spielberg wanted to make a game he could play with his kids, and it was actually good. It got good reviews, won some awards, and had solid sales numbers. It's even got a sequel, which was also well received. Definitely a step up from having a hand in almost killing the industry. You may have realized that there's not as much to say about individual games anymore, and that's in part because there are so many games at this point. There is something exciting in 2009 though, and that's Minecraft, a sandbox survival game from Mojang, originally an independent studio before later being acquired by Microsoft. Minecraft is a game where you mine and you craft. You can go straight survival mode, playing by yourself or with your friends. You can also go to creative mode with an unlimited amount of materials to make whatever you want. The game was not officially released until 2011, but 2009 was when it was first made available, and it was already inspiring creativity in many individuals, especially children. Minecraft is now the best-selling game in existence, with at least 238 million units sold. 09 also saw Riot Games League of Legends, a MOBA or multiplayer online battle arena, which is exactly what it sounds like. You got a character called a champion, go kill stuff, get XP. The main mode, Summoner's Rift, sees two teams trying to destroy the other's nexus. This has made it one of the most popular, if not the most popular, game in esports. That's right, we're talking about esports now, professional gaming competition. The game is free to play, and by 2011, had an average of over 11 million monthly players. That number has since risen to over 100 million. Critics have rated the game positively, and everyone seems to love it besides the people who play it. Riot has capitalized on League's popularity as much as possible. And I mean that. Marvel League of Legends comics, League of Legends virtual K-pop group, League of Legends animated TV show. It never ends. Speaking of never ending, the development of Final Fantasy vs. XIII was still ongoing. A new trailer for the game was shown off at Tokyo Game Show, showing gameplay for the first time, being from a demo build of the game. Nomura said that this trailer was made just to prove that the game was still in development. It was also revealed to be an open world game. Alright, 2010. Microsoft was very confused. They were being outsold by Nintendo. But how? They, Microsoft, had better graphics, more power, a better Seattle sports team. They had a lot over Nintendo, but not sales. So, they decided to take a play out of Nintendo's book and release their own motion control add-on in 2010, the Kinect. It's basically a motion sensor that can be used to play games, and it works some of the time. 35 million units sold though, which is pretty good, and it probably would have done even better if better Kinect compatible games came out. Sony also tried their hands at motion controls that year with PlayStation Move, these controllers with ball things at the end. PlayStation Move had largely the same issues as the Kinect, but selling 15 million by 2012, significantly less than Microsoft's attempt. And now it's time to go down that list again. What did we get this year? 
Alright, we've got Red Dead Redemption, that's Cowboy GTA, Mario Galaxy 2, Mass Effect 2, Starcraft 2, Rock Band 3, God of War 3, Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, World of Warcraft Cataclysm, that's an expansion, and Xenoblade came out in Japan as well. Xenoblade is a highly acclaimed JRPG developed by Monolith Soft and published by Nintendo. If you remember Xenogears from the Final Fantasy VII section, guess what? Same series. Or meta-series. Also, Final Fantasy XIII was released worldwide. Moving on to 2011, and we have Dark Souls now. Dark Souls was developed by From Software, and was a spiritual successor to their 2009 game, Demon's Souls. The game is an insanely difficult action RPG, and increased the desire for such difficult games. Basically, you run into an enemy, die, study their attack pattern, die, and repeat until you win. Or give up. Also, there's the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim, developed and published by Bethesda. It was a landmark open world RPG that is often praised for the amounts of freedom given to the player. Also, Valve released a bigger and better Portal 2, bringing 2011's Games Considered the Best of All Time counter to 3. This was also the year that Toys to Life games took off. Skylanders was the big one. The game came with a few toy figures, and others were available for purchase separately. Put your figure on the portal, and boom, he's in the game. You've got your Skylanders and original characters, but you've also got guys like Spyro the Dragon, from Spyro the Dragon. You can basically put whatever you want in this game. These games survived for a few years, but their popularity eventually died out. This year in Versus 13 news, Tetsuya Nomura stated that they were preparing to go into full production. He also revealed that the game was now running on a game-specific engine, rather than 13's Crystal Tools engine, which was being used before. Crystal Tools could no longer handle the ambitious open-world project, so Square Enix commissioned the brand new engine to be made for Versus 13. Square Enix also made the decision to move development to the upcoming generation of consoles, as if it was released on PS3, it would be irrelevant. Speaking of the PS3, Sony had a bit of a fiasco on their hands. The PS3's online functionality was down for nearly a month, and it was later revealed that personal information was exposed from 77 million accounts. Consumers were understandably outraged at Sony, and many lost confidence in the PlayStation brand. The hack cost Sony around $170 million, and they reported an annual loss of $5.7 billion that year, which was also in part due to an earthquake and tsunami on March 11th in Japan, which killed at least 20,000 people, so that's a little more understandable. Nintendo was doing better than Sony, but not having a great year either, and they posted their first ever net loss, down $530 million. Things weren't totally downhill though as they started having online presentations called Nintendo Directs to announce new projects, usually hosted by Satoru Iwata, both in Japanese and English. Nintendo also released their new handheld this year, the 3DS. It was a more powerful DS and could display in stereoscopic 3D, which most people turned off after 5 minutes. The 3DS started off a little slow game-wise, only really having Super Mario 3D Land in the beginning. Eventually though, the game library became very respectable. It was especially great if you were into JRPGs. The 3DS family of systems lasted from 2011 to 2020, and almost 76 million units were sold. Not quite as successful as the original DS, but still very good. Sony was ready to launch their new handheld too, and responded with the PS Vita in December for Japan. The PS Vita was definitely a handheld. You could even connect it to your TV to play games, which is a pretty cool idea. You just had to have a PlayStation TV, which almost nobody did. The PS Vita had Gravity Rush and Persona 4 Golden, and that was basically it. The system flopped hard, selling only about 16 million units. Sony has not tried to produce a handheld since. 2012 is notable for being the year that Telltale's The Walking Dead came out. It was a story-based adventure series released episodically, where your choices will impact the story. Or at least it gives you the illusion of choice. The game repopularized the Western style of adventure game in the West, and Telltale Games continued with the formula, making games for several popular franchises. 2012 was also a big year for Final Fantasy vs. 13. Square Enix president Yoichi Wada ordered the Type-0 team, that's Agito 13 from the original announcement if you forgot, so he ordered them to finish up work on their game, and then join the vs. 13 crew. 
Hajime Tabata, the director of Type-0, was brought in as co-director. Apparently, at the time they joined, only 20-25% of the game was done, and 90% of the team were initially against joining the project, but they were eventually convinced. This helped the game progress much more quickly. Tetsuya Nomura was often very busy with other projects, so having more help couldn't be a bad thing. 2012 was also around the time that mobile games started to get popular. There's not much to say about them, they're just games on your phone. Some games were free to play but incentivized other ways to pay, with microtransactions. This was also a strategy that EA decided to start using. Now that this console generation is finally winding down, let's take a look back. The Wii stands highest with over 100 million units sold. Despite running into some serious dilemmas, the PS3 and 360 both sold over 80 million, with the PS3 rallying to beat out the Xbox by just a few. This is, as of now, the most successful generation for the industry, including both handhelds and home consoles, over 500 million were sold in total. Some would call this the golden age of video games. Twenty twelve was the year that the new generation of home consoles began. Nintendo had dominated the last generation with the Wii and DS. All they had to do now was keep the momentum going. This was their answer. It sucked. With a title to confuse casual consumers and a weird gimmick attached to the console, yep, this is Nintendo. The Wii U did not do well. It is to this day Nintendo's worst selling console, selling only about 13 million units. It's one of the biggest failures in recent memory. Unless we're only talking about sales in Japan, in which case the Wii U has sold better than every Xbox combined. So why did it fail? Well, first the title. Having Wii in the same name was a very bad idea. It led people to believe that it was just another version of the Wii. Next, the gamepad. Not the worst idea ever, but the way they went about it, not great. No third party companies wanted to make games for this thing. The console did end up with some great games and a good catalog of retro games on the virtual console, but nothing was going to make it sell 50 million more units. If you had a Wii U, it was probably to play Mario Kart and Super Smash Bros. The Wii U also had Miiverse, which was a Nintendo social network that also came to the 3DS. It sure was... great? May 21st, 2013. It was time for Microsoft to reveal the new Xbox. Gamers feared that companies would continue to go the way of the Wii and mobile games, trying to cater to casual audiences. This was Microsoft's answer. This is it, Xbox One. Xbox, watch TV. And with that simple command, I'm watching live TV. Now here in Seattle, I'm a Comcast subscriber, so this is the programming available in my area. But hold on, let me show you how we're gonna you take live TV and make it not only integral. That's right, they didn't talk much about video games for this being a video game console reveal. Here's what we knew about the Xbox One at the time. The console had to be online to function, had the Kinect bundled in, you weren't allowed to play used or lent games, and there was no release date yet. Yeah, this was not a good look. It also had no backwards compatibility, but neither did the PS4, so they got off the hook with that one. This takes us to E3 2013. Microsoft needed to write the ship that was the Xbox One launch. And they sure tried. And as we've been promising, it's all about the games. Microsoft's conference was all about the games, and they even revealed a new Halo game. But this E3 conference wasn't enough to save them from the failure that was the initial reveal. They did reveal a release date though, and the price. Now, I'm excited to announce that Xbox One will launch this November in 21 markets around the world at $499 in the US and 499 euros in European markets and 140, uh, 429 pounds in the UK. I guess they didn't learn from the PS3. And let's not forget this interesting nugget. 
Fortunately, we have a product for people who aren't able to get some form of connectivity. It's called Xbox 360. Right. So stick with 360. That's your message if you know well, people don't like it. If, if you have zero access yeah. to the Internet, that is an offline <laughs> device. I yeah. mean, seriously. When I... So all Sony had to do at their press conference was just not be Microsoft. And that's exactly what they did. In addition to creating an amazing library of new titles on PlayStation 4, we're equally focused on delivering what gamers want most without imposing restrictions or devaluing their PS4 purchases. For instance, PlayStation 4 won't impose any new restrictions on the use of PS4 gamers. Yes, that's a good thing. This is how you share your games on PS4. Thanks. I'm very proud to announce that PlayStation 4 will be available at $399. With that, PlayStation had basically already won this generation before it had even started. It's not hard when your competition is the Wii U and Xbox One. One thing that came easier with the Xbox One and PS4 was the ability to share content. Both had features to take screenshots and record video straight from the console. You could even share them on social media if you had felt like it. More games started to implement in-game photo modes for the same purpose, and while we're on the topic of social media, gaming content online was booming. In particular, Let's Plays. The art of recording yourself talking and playing a video game. YouTube channels like PewDiePie, Markiplier, Jacksepticeye, and Game Grumps helped the genre's initial popularity, and it hasn't stopped growing since. Minecraft was a common game for creators to let's play, which is a major factor in why it became so popular, though many thought it was becoming oversaturated. Beyond let's plays, there was also live streaming. Sure, you could stream on YouTube, but it's been most popular on Twitch. Streaming is similar to let's plays, but it's live, and there's an element of interaction between the chat and the streamer. Whether it's a YouTube video or a live stream, there's all kinds of content to choose from now. You could watch something from one of your friends, a stranger from the other side of the world, a speedrunner, or an anime girl. Or you could even watch esports. That's one of the reasons why it's so popular today. It's also free advertisement for games, which companies seem to like. Except for Nintendo. They really did not like it at first. One popular game for Let's Plays back then was 2013's GTA V. It was a new GTA game, and it kind of sold well only around 155 million copies. Naughty Dog's The Last of Us also came out this year for PS3, and a year later to PS4. In an era where core gamers were worried about mobile games and motion controls, it was great for PlayStation to have a good exclusive story-based game. Now, let's go back to E3 real quick, because we've got some interesting things going on. Square Enix revealed that the long-awaited Kingdom Hearts 3, of course, to be directed by Tetsuya Nomura, but they also finally showed off a new trailer for Final Fantasy ver- wait. Uh-huh. Yep, your eyes do not deceive you. Final Fantasy vs. 13 is now Final Fantasy 15. Nomura later revealed that 15 ended with a climax, but they planned to continue the story. This propelled rumors that it would be a trilogy of games. In December of 2013, however, Tetsuya Nomura left Final Fantasy 15 after nearly 8 years of working on the project, and Hajime Tabata took over as the sole director. Officially, Tetsuya Nomura stepped down from 15 to focus on Kingdom Hearts 3. It is also possible that he was removed from the project by Square Enix. When asked about it in 2014, Nomura said, It was the company's decision. I can't say anything more than that. He later stated in 2019 he was not allowed to speak of Versus 13 for some time. Tabata says that he sat down with Nomura to discuss the direction of the game, saying, I wanted to make sure that characters like Noctis, the main character, that are so important to Nomura are maintained in the best possible way. Let's look at some of the changes Tabata made to the game. The character Stella was removed and replaced. The game's tone is much lighter than what was seen of Versus 13. The story was now to be completed in one game, rather than Nomura's plan to continue it. The ability to swap between characters during combat was cut, an aspect of the gameplay that Nomura had praised. Now it's time to talk about Capcom. 
Capcom is home to many popular franchises. Mega Man, Street Fighter, Resident Evil, Devil May Cry, Monster Hunter, Ace Attorney, and more. But in the early 2010s, they decided that they needed to appeal more to the West. The Japanese game market was declining, but westernization proved to not be the move for Capcom. The most egregious example was Ninja Theory's Devil May Cry reboot, DMC Devil May Cry. Wow, very creative title. The game actually sold quite well and was generally well received for its gameplay. Despite this, they also managed to make existing fans of the series insulted. The most obvious examples with the main character Dante. Here's Devil May Cry 3 Dante. And here's DMC, DMC Dante. Ninja Theory even held a presentation to show what Dante was and wasn't where they implied that the original Dante looked like a gay cowboy. Good job guys, sure that went over well. You can see why people were upset. And of course, it's not just appearance-based. Dante, along with other characters, were grossly mischaracterized. Not great. But Capcom didn't westernize all of their games, so what about the others? Well, let's take a look at Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney Dual Destinies. The game was not released physically outside of Japan and was only available on the 3DS eShop. Now, that's unfortunate, but acceptable. The bad part about this was the reasoning given for it. On the now defunct Ask Capcom forums, at the time, Senior Vice President Christian Svensson stated, If we'd said, no, it's not coming, it would have triggered the inevitable. Please bring it to the eShop at least, cries. Which makes it seem like the only reason it was released in the West at all was to stop people from complaining. Great move, Capcom. In the end, Svensson was laid off from the company months later, and Capcom thankfully realized why people liked their games, ceasing their Western push. 2014 was the year that Nintendo gave people some reason to own a Wii U. There was a new Zelda game on the block. Kind of. This is Hyrule Warriors, a Musou game. Musou is a genre introduced by 2000's Dynasty Warriors 2, and well, I think if there is a genre that can be explained solely with gameplay footage, this is it. By the way, Mario Kart 8 and Super Smash Bros. for Wii U came out this year. Smash was also on 3DS, but everyone was really waiting for the console version. The new Smash went all in on including third-party characters after Brawl introduced the first two. The newcomers included Pac-Man and Mega Man, with DLC involving Cloud from Final Fantasy VII, Ryu from Street Fighter, and Bayonetta. Oh yeah, Bayonetta 2 was published by Nintendo in 2014 as a Wii U exclusive. Strange. Another one of the Wii U's most well-known games is Sonic Boom. Sonic had a few enjoyable and well-received games since the 06 debacle, and now the Wii U is getting its own exclusive Sonic game. So let's cut to the chase. Sonic Boom is right next to Sonic 06 in the worst Sonic game of all time conversation. Around this time, indie games, independently developed games, started to come out more frequently and gain more popularity. It was now easier than ever to create a game with a small team or just by yourself and publish it to a digital storefront. One of these was 2014's Shovel Knight from Yacht Club Games, which was well received and received decent popularity. Moving into 2015, we have the biggest of them all, Undertale by Toby Fox. Undertale is what could be considered a viral game. It achieved an unprecedented amount of popularity in large part due to Let's Plays, live streams, and social media. Over the years, many other games have gained popularity in the same fashion. For example, Goat Simulator, Doki Doki Literature Club, Among Us, Five Nights at Freddy's, the list goes on. You could also apply this label to Minecraft, an early example that did it back in the early 2010s. Now that we're in 2015, let's talk about other games. First of all, Xbox announced backwards compatibility for the Xbox One, which was nice. One of the biggest games of the year was Witcher 3, which was released by CD Projekt Red to universal acclaim. The game was an open-world action RPG, and basically every aspect of it was praised. That includes the story, side quests, graphics, and of course, gameplay. The game won many Game of the Year awards. Nintendo's two biggest games of the year were Splatoon, a new third-person shooter, and Super Mario Maker, where you can create and share your own Mario levels for others to play. 2015 was also the year of the release for Metal Gear Solid V, The Phantom Pain, an open-world take on the series. If only it was that simple. Back in 2014, Hideo Kojima and filmmaker Guillermo del Toro co-directed PT, a playable teaser for a new Silent Hill game, developed by Kojima Productions, a Konami subsidiary led by Kojima. In early 2015, Konami announced a corporate restructuring that did not mention Kojima at all which was a little strange considering he was the executive vice president of Konami Digital Entertainment. Konami then removed all references to Kojima on the Metal Gear website and on Metal Gear promotional material. That day, GameSpot reported that there was a power struggle between Kojima Productions and Konami, 
which led to senior staff at Kojima Productions being given restricted access to the internet, emails, and phone calls. In May, new Konami president Hideki Hayakawa announced that they were not completely giving up on console games, but were moving on to a mobile-first strategy. In April, Konami removed PT from the PlayStation Store, something very rare for a big company to do. Metal Gear Solid V released on September 1st, 2015 to critical acclaim, receiving near-perfect to perfect scores around the board. The game even won some awards, but the story doesn't end there. Thank you very much, uh, Kiefer, for accepting that award. And uh, as you noticed, uh, Hideo Kojima is not here with us uh, tonight, and I want to tell you a little bit about that. Uh, Mr. Kojima had every intention of uh, being with us tonight, uh, but unfortunately he was uh, informed by a lawyer representing Konami uh, just recently that uh, he would uh, not be allowed to uh, travel to uh, tonight's awards ceremony to uh, accept um, any awards. It's, uh, he's still under an employment contract and it's, uh, it's disappointing and it's, it's inconceivable to me that a, an artist like Hideo would not be allowed to come here and celebrate with his peers and uh, his fellow uh, teammates uh, such an incredible game as Metal Gear Solid V, but that's the situation we're in. That's right, Kojima was not allowed to attend or receive awards for his games at the biggest awards show in the industry, the Game Awards. Hideo Kojima officially left Konami after nearly 30 years at the company, and with help from Sony Computer Entertainment, Kojima Productions became an independent studio. This was also the year that Halo 5 Guardians released. Halo was the main reason people bought an Xbox, so it had to be good. The Halo series had been handed from Bungie to 343 Industries for Halo 4, to mixed results, and this was 343's shot to improve. Halo games consisted of two main modes. The first is the story campaign, the second is the online multiplayer. The multiplayer for Halo 5 was good, people liked it, but the campaign was not looked upon as fondly, and it has been heavily criticized by fans and critics alike. Some complained that the marketing for Halo 5 was borderline false advertising, as it was misleading and made the campaign seem underwhelming in comparison. To add insult to injury, the game didn't even have local co-op, a staple to the series since the beginning. Halo 5 is debatably the most divisive game in the series, so the reasons to buy an Xbox One weren't so clear-cut anymore. There was the Master Chief Collection, a collection of Halo games, but it was not well received at launch, and you can already play every Halo game other than 5 on the 360. Some good news to come out of 2015 was that Final Fantasy VII was finally getting its long-anticipated remake. The game would be directed by Tetsuya Nomura, who didn't know that until his name showed up in an internal presentation. It says I'm the director for some reason, Nomura said to Yoshinori Kitase, the director of the original. Kitase responded, of course it does. Also, this was the year that China lifted their console ban. That was nice of them. 2016 was another interesting year for video games. Pokemon Go was released for mobile devices and was extremely popular during the summer. PlayStation VR also came out this year. Virtual reality hasn't become the next big thing as many expected, but it is pretty cool. Oculus is probably more popular for VR, but I forgot they existed until now. Just put on the headset, and you're in the game. Mighty No. 9 was another game to release, and not to great success. The game was from Comcept, a company founded by Keiji Inafune, who is most well known for his work on the Mega Man series. He is also known for helping Capcom's Western push go forward. Mighty No. 9 was a spiritual successor to Mega Man, and was crowdfunded on the website Kickstarter. Mega Man fans were antsy, as they hadn't received a mainline game since 2010. But due to an array of issues, including being developed for 10 separate consoles, the game was delayed several times. Of course, when the game was ready to release, they had to market it as well. You kill an enemy, and you can absorb their power-ups, stuff that'll make you faster and stronger, and make the bad guys cry like an anime fan on prom night. Insulting your target audience. Marketing 101. Anyways. It did eventually release, and was only average, which only made backers feel like they were cheated out of their money. Shenmue 3 had a similar situation. In 2015, series creator Yu Suzuki announced that the long-awaited sequel would be funded on Kickstarter. It was planned to launch around December 2017, but was then delayed to 2018, and then to August 27th, 2019. And then to its final release date of November 19th, 2019. 18 years after the critically acclaimed Shenmue 2 Shenmue 3 came out, to mixed reception. Crowdfunded games aren't always a terrible idea though, as Koji Igarashi had more success. After an, an extensive history of writing and producing Castlevania games, Igarashi left Konami to form his own studio, similarly to Hideo Kojima. 
He ended up creating the Bloodstained series as a spiritual successor to Castlevania, and the games were received very well. One of the biggest releases from this year was Final Fantasy XV, coming out a whole decade after the initial Versus XIII reveal. Well, that was nice of them. Much of what was originally intended for Versus XIII was either scrapped or reworked, with most of the characters and settings being salvaged. The game that was Versus XIII never released, and instead, we got XV built from its bones. Nevertheless, the game had the best launch for a Final Fantasy game, with 5 million copies sold in the first 24 hours. As of November 2021, almost 10 million copies have been sold. The game also received several story-based DLC episodes, but some future planned releases were cancelled in 2019. The game received mostly positive praise from critics, with the most divisive aspect being the story. Before we end this year off, it may please you to learn that Hideo Kojima ended up receiving his award at that year's Game Awards. Oh, and uh, also, Doom came back this year and was good. Now to 2017. 2017 is often considered to be the best year for gaming since 2007. The first big thing to come out of 2017 was the Nintendo Switch, a console handheld hybrid. It also had a screenshot button. That's pretty cool! It doesn't really fit into a console generation very well, but it has sold over 100 million units so far. It launched with The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, an open world Zelda game, which added many new things to the Zelda series. You can climb on everything, jump, weapons can be found, collected, and broken, plus there's some character customization, and much more. Breath of the Wild is often praised for the amount of freedom it gives the player, and is frequently cited to be one of the greatest games of all time. That's our Game of the Year winner, by the way. Pretty much unanimously. It was one of many in the influx of open world games, contributing to the genre's popularity. In the years since, the genre's prevalence has risen even further. Since 2017, we've had open world Zelda, open world Spider-Man, open world Halo, and tons of original open world games. They just keep coming. Of course, Breath of the Wild wasn't the only game of the year. Let's go down that list. First up, we have PlayStation's new open world game, Horizon Zero Dawn. There's also Persona 5, which was released worldwide this year. It's like Pokemon, but with more dating. Okay, that's not all. It has cool menus, too. Fortnite and PlayerUnknown's Battleground turned the Battle Royale genre into one of the most popular in the world. Battle Royales are online multiplayer games where the last man standing is the winner, making winning less frequent than in other genres. There was also Nier Autonoma, Resident Evil 7, Super Mario Odyssey, What Remains of Edith Finch, Cuphead, Sonic Mania, Neo, Hollow Knight, and Divinity Original Sin 2. That's not even everything. Also this year, Xbox finally won back some of its goodwill with the Xbox Game Pass, a gaming subscription service that offers over 100 games. It was also the year that controversy surrounding microtransactions and loot boxes peaked. The biggest controversy was predictably about EA and their game Star Wars Battlefront 2. The game is basically pay to win. If you pay, you quickly get things that will help you win more than people who play for free. The progression system was broken and people were mad. Eventually things were fixed and things turned around for the game, but there was a while when this was the biggest controversy in the gaming sphere. Now feels like a good time to talk about gacha games, a very popular genre that are usually, but not always, mobile games. Gacha games are kinda like gambling, but you're rewarded with anime girls, and occasionally boys. And if there's one thing better than money, that's it. The main draw of the game is summoning characters by magic or something using in-game currency, because they could have good stats, or rather because they're hot. There are also games like Xenoblade Chronicles 2 that implement gacha systems but are not inherently gacha games, and don't have microtransactions. Gacha games are typically free to play, but you can spend money if you really want that hot PNG. Some games incentivize spending money more than others, it really just depends on the game. And if there's a popular anime, or anime style game, there's a gacha game of it. And if there's a popular gacha game, there's an anime of it. Everything is gacha now. Fate. Final Fantasy, Fire Emblem, Pokemon, Shin Megami Tensei, Mario Kart, Dragon Ball, Naruto, the list goes on. There are, of course, original gacha games, and yes, there is, of course, an open-world gacha game. To keep users active, these games often introduce events with new characters to make things exciting. This often entails crossovers. Sometimes they even cross over with each other. Some of these crossovers are cool. There's the ones that, yep, sure are a thing. And then there's Ariana Grande and Katy Perry in Final Fantasy. Before we move on from the year, I'd like to bring attention to Famitsu's new Top 100 Games of All Time, as voted by its readers. That's right, they did it again. This time for their 1500th issue. This list is pretty even in terms of the all-time aspect. 
Though there are a few games from the 80s, there are around 30 games from each of the 90s, 2000s, and 2010s. It's a very different list from the 2006 one, so let's take a look. At the bottom, there's number 100, The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. Then we have The Witcher 3, Super Smash Bros. Melee, Hatsune Miku, Final Fantasy VIII, Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney, Final Fantasy Tactics, Final Fantasy IV, Dragon Quest II, Metal Gear Solid V, Metal Gear Solid III, The Legend of Zelda, Eco, Demon Souls, Hatsune Miku, Final Fantasy V, Monster Hunter Freedom Unite, Dragon Quest IV, Dragon Quest VIII, Final Fantasy VI, Final Fantasy XIV, Pokemon Red Blue, Kingdom Hearts, Persona 4, Final Fantasy IX, Hatsune Miku, Final Fantasy XV, Hatsune Miku, Dragon Quest X, Hatsune Miku, Kingdom Hearts 2, Super Mario Bros, Persona 3, Final Fantasy X, The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, Dragon Quest V. And this is where the list starts to get more questionable. There's definitely a bit of recency bias going on here. But we've got Danganronpa, Danganronpa 2, Final Fantasy IX, Xenoblade Chronicles, Persona 4 Golden, that's Persona 4 again, Yakuza 0, that's from 2015, Hatsune Miku from 2016, Shenmue 2, Danganronpa 1.2 Reload, that's just the first and second games again, Shenmue, Danganronpa V3 from 2017, Final Fantasy VII, The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild from 2017, Nier Autonoma from 2017, Splatoon from 2015, Dragon Quest III from 1988, which actually went up a spot, and finally number one, Persona 5 from 2016. So yeah, very different. There's a lot of repetition and some very evident recency bias, but it's a good way to show how the Japanese gaming market has changed from 2006 to 2017. On to 2018. Hmm, what do we have for this year? On one hand, we have the same old Call of Duty, Fortnite, EA Sports games, but we also have Monster Hunter World, the soft reboot of God of War, and a new Spider-Man game. Oh, also Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. One of the biggest selling points for Smash Bros. is the characters. If a new game is represented in Smash, it's either a big deal, or it's Fire Emblem. So, for Ultimate, every character in Smash history was brought back, which was, dare I say, a pretty big deal. Highly requested characters such as Ridley from Metroid and King K. Rule from Donkey Kong Country were included as newcomers. The roster brought back a total of 89 playable fighters with DLC into 2021 featuring characters like Joker from Persona 5, Hero from Dragon Quest 3, 4, 8, and 11, Banjo-Kazooie, Steve from Minecraft, Sephiroth from Final Fantasy 7, and finally, Sora from Kingdom Hearts. Around 25 million copies of the game have been sold, making it one of the most popular games on the Switch. 2019 saw some more good games. Hades is a roguelike game that surprised everyone from indie developer Supergiant Games. Roguelikes stem from the 1980 game Rogue, and are characterized by dungeon crawling through procedurally generated levels. Hades sold over a million copies and has been praised for its combat, characters, and story, winning several Game of the Year awards. Kojima Productions released Death Stranding this year, their first game since branching off from Konami. Reviews have ranged from Game of the Year to Bad. Devil May Cry 5 finally released, the first DMC game since the 2013 westernization debacle. Here is Dante, wearing a cowboy hat. Kingdom Hearts 3 was one of the biggest games of the year, as fans have been waiting six long years for the game. The game was released to mostly positive reviews, though longtime fans were split on several aspects of the game. The real reason we're talking about it, though, is because this game made it clear that Tetsuya Nomura is still salty about what happened to Versus 13. Without delving too far into spoilers, all I can say is that in Kingdom Hearts 3, there's a scene with characters that bear a striking resemblance to those of Versus 13. Nomura said in 2014 while developing Kingdom Hearts 3, I harness the burning anger in my heart into what I create. So it's not hard to believe that he left the project on bad terms, and it seems that Nomura is reimagining some of his Versus 13 ideas for Kingdom Hearts. Nomura's other project, Final Fantasy VII Remake, released the next year in 2020. The game ended up receiving pretty positive reviews, though, predictably, some fans complained about how different it was from the original. There are a lot of remakes and remasters nowadays. It's definitely safer for companies to put out things they know will sell. Let's take a look at 2020's top 10 best-selling games in the US. There are three yearly releases, one nearly yearly release, one collection that was only available for a limited time to maximize profit, one port of a 2014 Wii U game and its DLC, one remake, two normal sequels, and one original IP. And in case you weren't born yet, let me tell you that 2020 was a weird year, especially for video games. Nintendo started denouncing games and tweets and came under fire for some of their other business practices, which their casual audience did not care about because they were too busy playing Animal Crossing New Horizons. 
Animal Crossing New Horizons was the game everyone got because they were lonely and wanted to socialize with friends. CD Projekt Red later came out with Cyberpunk 2077, which despite being delayed several times, did not release in a very complete state. The goodwill CD Projekt Red had created with The Witcher 3 had all disappeared. Sony removed it from the PlayStation Store for a while, but I'm told that there's a good game hidden beneath all the bugs and glitches. With that, the console generation is over. The PS4 stands on top with over 116 million units sold. If you count the Switch in this generation, it's sitting right below that. The Switch has received almost all of the good Wii U games, so unless you're a huge fan of Xenoblade Chronicles X or Nintendo Land, the Wii U is essentially irrelevant and sits around 13 mil. And finally, we have the Xbox One, chilling at around 50 million. Wow, this is so well organized. The new generation of consoles came around with the PS5 and Xbox Series X S in 2020, but due to this little pandemic thing going around and chip shortages, they have been increasingly difficult to obtain. Also, the 3DS was discontinued that year, meaning that dedicated handhelds are currently dead. In 2021 and 22, we've had a few popular and critically acclaimed games. Nintendo released Metroid Dread, the first 2D Metroid in 19 years. Halo Infinite came out, being an open-world take on the series. It was the first Halo game since 5 in 2015. So far, there isn't much content for the online multiplayer, but the story campaign has proven popular with fans. FromSoft gave fans Elden Ring, which is basically open-world Dark Souls, to put it simply. Finally, Game Freak switched up the Pokemon formula with Pokemon Legends Arceus. And really, most series we've talked about today are still around in some capacity. But, now we're in the present. There's no way to know where to go from here, but this is where we stand. EA still makes FIFA and Madden and all that. Everyone hates them, but they still make a ton of money. There's a company named Tencent that owns everything now, including League of Legends Riot Games. They have also invested in Activision Blizzard, a company created through a merger of Blizzard's former parent company, Vivendi Games and Activision. Activision Blizzard have since been the center of several controversies, and are currently being sued for alleged sexual harassment in the workplace. Also, Microsoft bought them for $70 billion. Games from Kojima Productions are arguably more hyped up than anything Konami has produced recently. Konami seems to be doing just fine though, mainly working on pachinko machines and mobile games. They just don't seem to know what they're doing with console games and their popular series. They have handed their franchises to others as Netflix made a good animated series out of Castlevania, and a few of their characters appeared in Smash Bros. Ultimate. 2021 was the 35th anniversary of the Konami Code, and the company did quite a bit for it. They released some things online like a lo-fi hip-hop video and an original Konami Code song. They also opened up a Konami Code pop-up store in Akihabara, so that's cool. The store featured Konami Code merch, as well as merch from games including Gradius, Police Knots, Snatcher, and Tokimeki Memorial. They also announced a game contest for indie developers to make a game based on one of their classic franchises. Valve still makes games sometimes, but they really don't need to as Steam is making them way too much money. Their most recent game was Half-Life Alex in 2020, a virtual reality game that takes place between the stories of the first two. It was the first Half-Life game in 13 years. Oh, and we kind of forgot to mention that cross-platform play has become a thing, meaning you can play Minecraft on your Switch with your friend that's playing on an Xbox. Final Fantasy VII is now available on a Nintendo cartridge. Sony has changed its focus to big western blockbuster games. This leaves a lot of older series dead, but the new games are welcomed by fans and make Sony a lot of money. Also, in 2022, they bought former Halo developer Bungie. Nintendo has a theme park now, and there's an animated Mario movie, and there's plans for a Nintendo museum. Microsoft is still here somehow. As is Atari, they're releasing 2600 games again, and another VCS. One of the several unearthed ET cartridges is currently being held at the Smithsonian Institution. Video games have evolved from a cool new toy into a new interactive art form combining the talents of writers, programmers, musicians, artists, and more. Video games can help form new relationships and tell emotionally captivating stories. And now, all we can do is look to the future.
Nina. <laughs> 